This lecture will be with Hashem Leilui Nishmat Chaya Bat Avraham Shmuel Tzvi Ben Binyamin Noach Rafael Ben Yosef Chaim Leilui Nishmat Shimon Ben Miriam Ruven Ben Yosef Ruti Bat David Also Refua Shlema of Lulu Bat Selma David Ben Chava Leilui Nishmat Nathan Ben Rachel Shiduch and Parnasa Tova for Chaviv Ben Mazal פרנסה טובה, תוכנה בת אדלה, אליהו בן חנה, אברהם בן חנה. at 6 p.m. It's going to be Hanukkah Tabayit in Mill Basin. And right after that, at 8.30 in Great Neck, in English. 8.30 in Great Neck. Uh, before I forget, I want to remind you tonight, and we still didn't finish 1% of what you can say about the parasha. There's a lot to say. I just try to speak about things that relates to us, because remember, the Torah is a school for life. There's no better school than that. This is the creator of the world, in his book, writing to you events, how they turned out, the consequences of them, how he feels about it. From here you learn what he likes, what he hates, what he would expect you to do, what he would not want you to do. What caused him anger, midat adin, judgment? What gives him the, you know, the will to help us, the Jewish nation? All kinds of things. There's thousands of, of subjects that you can learn from the Torah. Problem of most people, they just don't learn Torah. They don't learn Torah. And even if they listen to, sometimes to some Torah, you have to be extremely careful in today's world, extremely careful who you're learning Torah from, who, who are the speakers you're listening to. Because some speakers, especially those 16 in my blacklist, every second you listen to them, you'll be punished severely for that. It's no joke. It's not, first of all, it's not mitzvah of limut Torah because they're all apikorsim, machtiyah arabim. They for sure have no share to the world to come, all these reshaim. And if you want them to drag you to where they go in the next world, keep listening to them. You're going to end where they will end. Especially Santa. <laughs> Santa, he looks very religious in his look, but he's the number one danger to the Jewish world today. The number one. There's no bigger danger to Jewish souls than him. Santa from Minnesota. You know, but he's everywhere. He comes to visit in town. He not only a heretic, he actually call for revolt against Hashem. Mamash to rebel against Hashem. The filthy book he wrote, it's outrageous, it's such chutzpah. A person can have such chutzpah to write such a book against God. In a million years, you will not find one Christian and one Muslim that will dare to write such filth, to call for war against God. I didn't ask to come to the world. You have no right to tell me what to do. It drives me nuts when I see this. There is a very important Talmud Chacham Tzadik in Israel who happened to be the cousin of Rabbi Yaron Ruven. His name is Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon. It's Talmud Chacham, serious with very solid ashkafa. Those who learn in good yeshivot in Eretz Israel, you see right away, their ashkafa is pure. No nonsense. They don't have these modern American inventions that came from universities. It didn't penetrate, Baruch Hashem. So they learned with very good rabbanim. One of his rabbis is Rav Gidon ben Moshe. He's one of the biggest dayanim in the world. For every question in Yerushalayim, you don't know the answer, you run to him. So because you have good rabbanim, Rav Ben Tzion Abba Shaul, Rav Ovadia, Rav Gidon Ben Moshe, very important chachamim, in the Sephardi world, 
you become a great product. If your Rabbanim are university rabbis, you become a horrible product. And then you continue to infect other souls with your garbage. And that's very, very dangerous because when you write a book like that, you have no right to judge me. We don't have to apologize to you. You have to apologize to us after 2,000 years of what we've been through. You don't find it. I don't think you're going to find any Muslim that will dare to speak like this. Go in, go in, that have a fake religion. They don't even follow the book of God. Most of what they follow is nonsense. Their ideology is not as bad as this one. And unfortunately, the Satan arranged that he will be popular. There's hundreds of heretics. I don't pay attention to them so much. I picked up those 16. You know why? Those who have views, those who don't have views, why wasting time? Warning from them. But those who actually read so many people and destroys them, some uh, people that knows Hashkafa, know Jewish Hashkafa, made warning videos on YouTube about him. They made a collection from what he's speaking, in his horrible speeches, and they, they made a collection. All you have to do is just, just put his name in the garbage that comes from his mouth, and you see that. One of the, of the jewels that he has, that a woman should, her beauty is not private. She should expose her beauty to the men on the street. That's why she has to put fancy wig that all Tony and Vinny and Ahmed and Itzik, they all would look at her, a married woman, a mother of Jewish children, a rabbit and makes fun of it. And another time he said, homosexuality is not abomination. But it's a clear verse in the Torah. When you modify the book of God, when you become reformy, the Torah says it's toeva. Toeva. Toeva means abomination. It's written in the Torah. Forget about commentary. It's a verse in the Torah. There's no, it's not open for negotiation. It's not. It's not. It's just a sin. I have my sins, you have your sins. Our job to do all the sins of the Torah together. <laughs> he laughed. And religion is the worst thing. The problem is when you become religious, all the problems begin. Now in a normal world, someone that learns Torah in Yeshiva, in less than five minutes the most, would know to run away from him like you run away from poison. But the world is so terrible today. The level became so low that someone like me has to come and explain mandatory things to people. And some of them still question it. After what they see, they're still not getting the point. They don't understand what, I, what Ashkafa of Torah is. What ideology of Torah is. And this is where we find ourselves. I just want to read to you the words of the Holy Rambam. The Rambam speaks about people that are considered apikorosim. What is the word apikoris? Apikoris comes from a Greek word. It was a Greek heretic in the time of Greece that his name was Apicores. Apicor, that was his name. So when they want to name someone as heretic, they took the name of that big famous Greek heretics, and from now on, for more than 2,000 years in Judaism, we use this expression as someone that is heretic, infidel, and contradict the foundations and the principles of the Torah. This is called Apicores. What is an apicores? Someone that you cannot count in a minyan. It doesn't matter how nice is his beard. Or if he has a black sombrero. And his tzitziot are all the way down to the floor. Once you see the garbage that comes from someone's like this mouth and the way his corrupted mind thinks, you're not allowed to count him in a minyan. If you count him in a minyan and people say amen, kadishim, brachot, it's all brachot levatala. It's not mashlim minyan. Should know it. 
doesn't matter what title they give him, Rabbi, this, uh, I don't know, they have all these titles here in America. Titles do not, does not impress Hashem. Hashem needs what's in your heart, what's in your mind, what's in your mouth. That's what it is. If only heresy come from there, the problem with, the, with, the, with, the, with this people, how they trick the people, is just like in uh, daily, how do they trick the customer? They can't give everything rotten, right? They want to sell uh, seeds, peanuts, pistachios. They're not going to give everything rotten. Every one you eat will be rotten. No one will ever come back. So they mix, they mix the rotten ones with the good ones. Meaning, if you eat eight that are nice, okay, and two are bad, still... Uh, you speed it up, worse comes to worse. But like, okay, there's few delicious ones. This is how these people do. This is what they do. They say certain things that are written here and there, which are interesting. And they push their heresy in between the lines. And that's what confused the people. Because if you find a reform, uh, some gay reform uh, rabbi from Manhattan, it's not even Jewish, and everything he speaks about is against the Torah, nobody normal will waste time on someone like that. But when someone speaks about certain things that are written, and in between he pushes his horrible, rotten ideology, some people are confused. They're confused. They don't understand that all you need, even if you speak an hour, all you need is two minutes of heresy. This person can never be seen ever again. It's a crime, a crime against Hashem to listen to them. It's no joke. How many times people have to hear it until they get the point? You want to be punished? Fine, it's on you. Don't say nobody warned you. It's a crime to listen to such people. It's a crime to listen to someone who invites a Christian missionary priest or whatever he is to speak in his synagogue or to bring the worst Machtiat Arabim in history, Dr. Ruth. Please don't even Google her. I don't want to be responsible for what you're going to find. The worst, the, f- the biggest field, the biggest machtiat arabim. How many marriages she destroyed, how many men she destroyed with her horrible books and things. Bring her into the synagogue, make her sit next to the holy Torah and kiss up to her for an hour and a half with such hypocrisy. Ugh, I want to vomit when I see these people. I just want to vomit when I see them, every one of them. Such reshaim arurim. And people not opening up their eyes. I don't get it, man. There's not enough kosher people. Baruch Hashem, we still have enough kosher speakers. You don't find. You can never go wrong with Rav Victor Miller. Just listen to him all your life. That's it. It's holy, perfect, no mistakes, everything solid. Everything is with Kedusha, everything is accurate. Don't worry, it can go wrong. can go wrong with him. There are many other ones. You have Rav Shimshon Pinkus Zatzal. You have Rav Bravda. There's a lot of great Rabbanim here in America, Baruch Hashem. Lo Alman Israel. There are many other good ones which I don't know. I'm not so familiar with all American speakers, especially all these Talmud Chachamim of the Yeshivot. But I'm sure you can find kosher ones. Baruch Hashem. There is enough kosher speakers still in the world to keep you occupied from morning to night, 365 days a year. The day that we won't find any more chachamim, Mashiach would come. The Gemara says, And ben David bat shelo yichlu hachachamim in ador. But since Mashiach didn't come, that means there are still chachamim in ador. Speak Hebrew? You can ask me. I give you many good names of Hebrew speakers. You speak in English? We'll have a few good ones for you as well. But please do not let the Satan fool you. Do not, do not click ever on any one of those 16 heretics. You be very careful. And this is just for you to understand. Uh, so, every person that contradict one of the 13 principles of the Torah. You know, when you want to be a Jew, you have to go through a conversion test. The bed didn't ask you a question. The main condition in a conversion that the Goy or Goya 
except on themselves to keep all the 13 principles of Judaism, as it's written by the Rambam. In the Sfaradi Sidurim, it's right by the end of Shachrit. They put it over there. Some people read it after the tefillah, so like this they know it by heart. Every Jew must know it by heart. Those are the 13 principles. 13 principles. Just like when you want to be a computer programmer and they teach you in school, let's say that there are 13 principles about computer programming. If one of them you won't know, you will never be a programmer. You need to know all 13 perfectly. If there are such things. Just, I'm just giving a mashal. So, you need to know them. One of the 13 principles of the Torah is that Hashem reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Turn right, not left. Left is dangerous. <laughs> so, one of the 13 principles of the, of the Torah, that Hashem reward the righteous and punish the wicked. And every Jew that denies that, that said, oh, that's not the case. Everything that happened, we don't understand why it happens. I say, yes, we don't understand. We, we don't have prophets today. But we do know that if Hashem brings us tragedies, that means the judgment is very active right now. Every Talmud Chacham in the past 2,000 years will tell you that. Only today you have all kinds of heretics that try to rewrite the Torah. No, there's no such thing. Hashem doesn't punish. There are punishments in life. We are being punished daily. You refuse to admit, it's up to you. You teach people that there's no such thing. It, you, you can't predict the 13 principles of the Torah. You can't predict verses in the Torah. You can't predict the whole Rambam. You can't predict the Ariya Kadosh. You can't predict the Shulchan Aruch. You can't predict Rishit Chochmah, Sha'are Tshuva, Rabbeinu Yonah. You can't predict the Pele Yoetz. You can't predict Orchot Tzadikim. You can't predict Mesilat Yisharim. What don't you can't predict? But you want to hear the interesting thing is, I have a very good friend, he's a Chabadnik in Israel, he's a genius, genius Talmud Chacham. Hashem blessed him with photographic memory. And he's a Sali Talmud Chacham, meaning you don't have nonsense by him. Whatever he teach, whatever, he gives also speeches in Hebrew, very, very strong. And uh, sometimes the Chabad people, which they have very soft approach, they come to argue with him. Meaning, in their eyes, he's making them bad name. We don't talk about punishments. We don't talk about aggressive things. Why all of a sudden you look like Chabadnik, you dress like a Chabadnik, you know all the books of Chabad, and you speak so strong? The problem with them is that they're not in his level, because he's a super genius. He remember every word, every, every Shulchan Aruch, Shas. He knows the whole Baal Atania by heart. So when they begin to argue with him, after five, ten minutes, they run quickly because they already see that people start to laugh at them. Their knowledge is very poor compared to him. So he proves to them that whatever they say, it's incorrect. Very simple. So I asked him, I told him, you know what, if I'll make a shiur from the Tanya to show the truth of the Torah, Baal Tanya, for those who do not know, is the founder of Chabad. He started the Chabad movement. It was over 200 years ago. That's the beginning of Hasidut. Baal Shem Tov, right after Baal Tanya. And the book of the Tanya is full of Kabbalistic ideas. It's a very deep book, very holy book. The, the rabbi was extremely in a high, extreme high level. And he speaks about all the words of the Gemara and parts from the Zohar. And he speaks about Olam Abba and reward and punishment and Genom and Gilgulim, everything which somehow was forgotten today. Ah, well, what happened to all of that? This is the foundation of your group. You form the group. You form a group, it's like a club. VIP club, VIP club X, VIP club Y, VIP club A. Every VIP club has his uh, guidance and, and, and principles, no? How all of a sudden you pick and choose? So I asked him, why don't you make a shiur? If we have to translate it in English, we will. Bring all the sources, once for all. For all these people that are naive, they don't know. 
They think that there are two different Torahs here. The Torah of Rabbi Mizrahi of the Torah of Mendel from Lubavitch. There's no such thing. There's only one Torah. There is only one Talmud. My Talmud and Rav Mendel's Talmud is the same Talmud. My Baalatanya and his Baalatanya is the same exact book, word by word. Same thing. Even the Nusach of the Tefillah of Chabad is the Ari, which is very similar to the Ari of the Sfaradim, with some minor, very, very minor changes. Even the Mezuzot is like Sfaradim. The Tzadik is with the Yud turning to the right. Not like the Ashkenazim, right? The Yud towards the, towards the Nun. There's a lot of similarity. A lot of similarities. There's only one main difference all of a sudden, that now the Musar part of the Torah slowly, slowly disappeared. And I repeat it for the million time. We do not have permission to decide what to teach, what not to teach. What's written in a Chumash, every Jew must know. Forget about the politics behind it. Oh, yeah, no. We, forget it. If Hashem gave the Torah, it's a public document. They teach it in every yeshiva, from pre-1A. Everything that's written in a chumash, every Jew must know. Maybe you wait a few years until he grow up, he's a child, okay, certain things the Rebbe will skip. But by the age of Bar Mitzvah, you know, you know what the boys in Bar Mitzvah already learned? They learn Kiddushin, they learn about women, about intimacy, about relationship, the sugiot in the Talmud. <laughs> they come home, it's 13, 14, talks about... Very deep things about relationship, about woman, about that, about witnesses, about her ktuba, about giving her a get. Women that did things that are not supposed to. It's all, it's all in every yeshiva. So everything eventually when you become bar mitzvah, by the way, in case you don't understand, two, three generations ago, people in bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah age were already married. Boys and girls. They were very mature, not like today. The American mentality made them immature. It takes time until they become mature. But uh, two or three generations ago, Faradim and Ashkenazim, by age 13, 14, almost everyone was married already. Maximum 18. That's it, 18. Boys also? Yeah, boys and girls. Do you know our grandmother, some of them in Morocco, Iraq, Syria, age 12 already, would already get married. As soon as she became a woman. Age 12. That's when a woman become a woman officially. But today, okay. So today no women are mature and no boys are mature. So it takes six, seven more years to mature. Still not the end of the world. By 20, almost everyone is mature enough. You know? So we must teach what the Torah say to teach. Zohar, it's Kabbalah. Few people learn it. One percent. Most people don't learn it. They learn Gemara, they learn Halakha, they learn Rambam, they learn Musar, they learn Chumash, some learn Navi. Zohar, some people are attracted to Kabbalah. They learn Kabbalah, but that's only after they are already full of lots of knowledge of, of every other book. Don't, be, you don't come as an ignorant and decide to be a Kabbalist. It's a joke. You have to be 40, you have to be married, you have to finish the Shas, post scheme. You have to be a mamash chacham. So you start learning Kabbalah. One way or the other, what Hashem didn't want everyone to know, it was in very deep book, side books, that not everyone learned. They didn't teach in, uh, in first grade Zohar. Okay, fine. So certain things, you know, you have to, you have to go to specific rabbis to teach you. But... Everything that's written in a Chumash and in a Gemara and in a Rambam and in Shulchan Aruch, this was written knowing there are children and teenagers and everybody learns it. So why all of a sudden now in this generation people want to rewrite our uh, history? I don't get it. So here is the words of the Rambam. The Rambam speaks about Machtiyah Rabim, people that actually affecting the public to commit sins. We have all kinds of Machtiyah Rabim. There are Machtiyah Rabim with their mouth. There are Machtiyah Rabim by the way they dress on the street. 
They are Machtia Rabin by their actions. That's uh, like a DJ. A DJ in a mixed dancing party. Not religious party. By playing the music, he affects hundreds of people to commit a very serious sin from the Torah. It can be every night. Hundreds of people, every night, 365 days a year. is <laughs> a terrible destruction that he caused to the souls of many people. There are people who are machtia rabim in their speeches, like I just mentioned before. There are people who are machtia rabim in their horrible books. They write their nonsense and their filth in the books, and some people buy it. They read it, and they believe in it. Some people change their good way into a terrible way because of the influence they have from those horrible, those horrible books. All these magazines that you go here on Friday to buy in all kinds of supermarkets call themselves religious magazines are all fake. None of them is religious. They have some religion in it, but they are not kosher magazines. You don't have kosher magazines today. All the advertisements about all these fancy wigs and women with their face and their makeup and all these vacation places and all this Vegas and Miami come on a cruise. That's not the way of the Torah. Enough with this garbage. That's not what you give a reform family. A kosher Rebbe from Boro Park would not let his children even touch it. They don't have ashgacha. They don't have a supervi- supervision. No one check what they publish. They publish columns from all kinds of heretics people, include the one who brought the priest into, uh, the, the, the missionary into his shul. Those are the people who write. By reading what they write, it destroys your soul. Like I say, this is people, you cannot count them in a minyan. Cannot listen to what they say. Because even if 80% of what they say is true, the 20%, that's what kills you. That's what contaminates your mind. Even music that it's written by wicked people make a damage to your soul. Music, without coming into conversation with the composer. People think, ah, big deal, I listen to music. I don't understand the words. Yes, you don't understand the words, so it doesn't let you think all kinds of non-kosher thoughts. It's a love song, but since you don't understand Spanish, you listen to it, or Russian, or whatever it is. So you say, I don't understand what they write. Yeah, you're right. Allahically, there's nothing to trigger your Yetzirah. Right? Especially if it's a man, a woman. What's, what could be wrong? Rabbi Nachman of Breslev writes, he's into Kabbalah a lot. And he said that it makes a very big damage into the soul. Why? Because just when a person cooks his food and he puts a part of his nefesh into that cooking, a person that writes music, he puts a part of his nefesh into this music. And the music is a food for the soul. When you consume music, it goes, it's like injecting a drug into your system, to your spiritual system. And all the traits of this Nazi from Hamburg or from Berlin that wrote this music goes into your system. No wonder how you become heretic after a year or two. There are hidden things here that people no, don't take to consideration. All these Israeli singers with the tattoos, all these Mechalele Shabbat, all these drug addicts, that they sing songs, sometimes they trick you. They sing religious songs. Yeah. They take words from Tehillim and they say, oh, wow, so finally he sings some religious songs. Yes, the, the words are no problem. It's David HaMelech. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong with David HaMelech. The melody, the melody and the mouth of this Rasha Merusha, that all they eat trefot and all they smoke grass and inject needles. And who knows what else he does. Chalel Shabbat Faresia. You're listening to his voice. It penetrates your system. It causes you very big damage. It's no joke. No joke. What can you do? You know? I can make a side comments. I uh, spoke to Big Chacham in Israel on my last trip. There was a boy there. I said to the Chacham, what, uh, what can you do to convince this boy to stop listening to this music? He was a good boy, learning in yeshiva. Everything is, Baruch Hashem, okay with him. But he likes music. 
And because of that, he sometimes have in his playlist all these Israeli singers. So I, did, I did, personally didn't like the answer of the Chacham, but I know he's a very, very holy person, gave his life for the Torah, and has very, very bright mind. He told me, you should pray to Hashem that that will be the only problem of our teenagers today. You should just say thank you to Hashem that that's the only problem that this boy has. Meaning, it's such a poor generation, it's such a low, dark generation, that you coming to cry to be about the music that they listen to? You don't know what other things are happening as we speak? Not that I denied what he say. I mean, it's clear to me. I mean, I deal with the public. I know it. But I say, I'm me, I'm the little nothing. I say, just because people commit horrible crimes doesn't give permission to commit small crimes. But here we're not even talking about the actual sin here. We are talking about the spiritual damage that it makes. Because once you start to make spiritual damage to your neshama, that's when it affects you when you come to keep other mitzvot. All of a sudden you don't want to wake up in the morning, you don't want to pray anymore. You lose your kedusha. You're attracted to all kinds of other things. None of these magazines is kosher. None of them. There's no kosher magazines. No? A woman allowed to read heresy? A woman allowed to read a column by someone who brings a priest into a synagogue? To motivate the community? Not just a, not a priest, I keep saying priest. A missionary. Someone who hunts Jews to become Christians. Someone that says they have to pray for Hitler. Someone like that, after he murdered millions of our people. You bring to into my thing. You pay me a hundred million dollar cash. I would not let him step one step to the door. Forget about to speak. To sit in the synagogue, I wouldn't let him. Hashem is my witness. A hundred million dollar on the table. And they tell me, he just want to come sit. Someone who say, I have to pray for Hitler. That he dedicate his life for JC. All he wants is to bring people to follow his master, JC. He's God. You know, when a Goya say to you, God bless you, it's a very tricky blessing. Because some Goyim, they have in their mind the real God. The God of heaven and earth. Our God and the real God of the world. But some Christians, when they say, God bless you, they mean JC. This is their God. Even among Christians, there are different ideologies. Some Christians believe that J.C. is the Messiah, but he's not God. And some people believe that he's God, son of God, God. Meaning, besides God, there is another entity, God forbid. You have to be very careful with this. Bottom line, Rabotai, Benji, people are cold here. Where did he go? Put the heat. Thank you. So, uh, I just want to conclude and we move on. These are Pikorsim and Minim and Kofrim Batora and Machtiya Rabim, all these people that I mentioned. Conclusion, the Rambam writes in Ilchot Shuva, chapter 3, Alacha 14. En laem chelek laolam haba. They have no share to the world to come. Why, but what about if they keep Shabbos? They keep Shabbos. Maybe they give tzedakah. Maybe they eat strictly kosher. You think the Rambam didn't know it? Most Jews in his time were Shomer Shabbat. Most Jews in his time ate kosher. Who ate in a Jewish nation not kosher 900 years ago? People would come to shul. If you don't come to shul, you're not part of the community. Everyone was traditional and religious and very religious. Those are the people he talks about with this beard and sombreros or turbans. Once they fall into this category, The Rambam say, I recommend you to be very careful from them and to stay away from them. So next time, don't say that I warned you. I wrote you the Rambam. Almost the whole Shulchan Aruch is like the Rambam. Almost everything, 90%. You 
אז גדול הפוסקים ברמב״ם, everyone agree, ספרדים, אשכנזים, חסידים, תימנים, unanimously, ask anyone, who is גדול הפוסקים? רמב״ם. who is גדול המפרשים? רש"י, nobody argue. ask anyone, who is the, be- the best, biggest commentary on the Torah ever? That's the matter, who you ask? Ask Yoeli from Satmer, ask Mendel from Chabad, ask uh, Saadia from Yaman, ask uh, uh, Jojo from Morocco, uh, ask Fischel from Poland, who is the, doesn't matter. Everyone will say Rashi, without Rashi can I move one step in the Torah. Chumash, Gemara, it's all Rashi. <laughs> How Judaism would look without Rashi, can't even imagine. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a gift to the world that Hashem sent. There are a lot of, Baruch Hashem, other unbelievable commentary. But everybody knows, tap, 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 authority and commentary on the Torah, Rashi. Tap, 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 posek. In the last thousand years, Rambam. Right or wrong? That's it. No argument. Baruch Hashem, at least those two things is unanimous, because on other things you can have a lot of argument. Huh? I don't, I don't need your askama, but they do. You see, I want them to know that when I tell them it's true, here, Hasid, agree. Litvish, agree. When he's awake, agree. Bukhari is agree. The Svaradi agree. The Chalabi agree. Everyone agree. Anyone disagree? Baruch Hashem. Tov, we all agree. So, here I just read to you Rambam. Tov, there's a beautiful thing that we read on Shabbat that needs an explanation. It looks very strange when you read it first. If you don't understand what you read, first time you read it, it looks mamash very strange. I want to ask you a question. If someone comes to shoot at your house, לא עלינו. Some terrorists stand outside, from far away, פשש, he shoots. And you have uh, ten kids. Ten kids. And that person, the invader, is about to break into the house. So what do you do? You say to the two boys, you stand in this room by the door, by the front door. You go to the kitchen, hide over there. You go upstairs, you hide over there. You go to the second floor. You go to the attic, and you hide in the box in the basement. You divide the kids to five groups. Which kids are in the highest danger? The one who's right by the front door. Which kids have the lowest danger? Those in the box, all the way in the basement, or those in the attic, right? So the ones very close to the door are in immediate range to get hurt. The one that are in the kitchen, second. The one that in the first floor, third. The one in the fourth floor, five. The one in the attic, six. And the one in the box in the basement, seven. You get the point, right? Yeah. This is exactly what Yaakov Avinu did. Let's read. Vayasem et ha-shfachot ve-et yaldeem rishona, ve-et le'a ve-ilade achronim, ve-et Rachel ve-et Yosef achronim. Yaakov divided the, the family to three groups. First, Zilpa and Bila, the concubines, the Pilagshim. They are two of the Jewish mothers. Twelve tribes came from four mothers. Those are the two mothers, Bila and Zilpa. But they were not official wives. Lavan gave Yaakov, uh, Lavan gave Yaakov each one of his daughter with an assistant, right? And those assistants were kosher, kosher to bring kids to the world. In the old days, it was the custom to have pilakshim. It's very interesting. So now it looks, for someone who doesn't understand the depth of the Torah, it looks very, very strange. So what does Yaakov do? He puts the kids of the concubines with the two mothers, in the front, meaning they're not so important. Who comes after Leah, which is an official wife, and her sons? And who is in the end the one he loves the most? Rachel and Yosef. 
What is it like? That he has preferences. A father has kids, some he loves more than the other. The one he loves less, he put them to get all the exposure. Is this allowed or not allowed? When you read it in Sh- on Shabbat, you didn't think about it? It didn't bother you? It bothered you, right? <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to see something here is off. So from first reaction, when you read it, you may think, okay, maybe some fathers love some kids more than he loves the other. Because he loves the mother more. He has few wives. This wife he loves more, automatically he loves the children more. That wife he loves less. Automatically loves the children less. There is some logic here. The question is, are you allowed to do such thing? To show the other kids that you love some kids more than them? The answer, everyone agree, absolutely not. How do we know? Because Chazal complained that because Yaakov made a special outfit to Yosef, that's the reason we ended up in Mitzrayim in slavery. <laughs> So Chazal said that Yaakov should have not done it. They criticized Yaakov for making special clothes to only one son, creating jealousy among the others. And that's why they threw him to the pit, and that's why he ended up in Mitzrayim, and that's how it all began. So Chazal criticized Yaakov. That means what what he did was not the right thing to do. The question is, why is he actually repeating the same mistake now? Why is putting the kids of the Pilakshim first, and then the kids of Leah next, and then Rachel and Yosef in the end? He didn't see already what happened the last time he prepared Yosef, then all the others. Let's see now they're all going to get saved, and Esav wouldn't kill anyone in the end. But what impression those kids will have for the rest of their life? I'm garbage in the eyes of my father. My father is the holiest man in the world. God loves him. God changed his name to Israel. God made him all these promises. And me, I'm his son. I'm nothing. he rather I die than someone else die. There are consequences to such things. On the other hand, you may say, okay, now it's Pikuach Nefesh. In a general everyday life, you have no permission to prefer one kid from the other. You have to give equal love to all of them. Definitely in public, don't make others jealous. But if it's a chas v'shalom pikuach nefesh, a Hamas terrorist come with a gun to your head, and he says to you, we were going to kill one of your two boys. Pick up a name. If there, are, there is one you love very much and the other one gives you very hard time, rebel against you, gave you a lot of, a lot of problems, it's not that you want him, Chaz Shalom, to die. But if now you have to choose one of the two, who, who you would choose? The one that does everything for you or the one who only gave you a hard time? <coughs> By the way, is it permitted or no? No. no? It's not allowed. You're not allowed to pick up names. If the Goim come and say, give us one Jew, give us one Jew, and if not, we'll kill all of you. You're not allowed to give them a Jew. You cannot pick up somebody and give it to them. Here, take this guy. Why? We don't like him. Nobody here likes him in town. Do us a favor. Kill him and we'll all be good. Not allowed. But if the Goim already come with a name, the Goim already say, we want this Mr. Such and Such, we have a warrant, we want to kill him, we want to hang him. Since they already named who they're going to kill, and if you will resist, they'll kill everyone, then you let them take him. Because they already came with the target. But if they don't care, anyone you give us will kill. You're not allowed to take. They're going to kill 500. 500 will die and you don't give them one. Why? You cannot decide which one right now is better than the other, which one should die, which one should live. Already in the hand of Hashem. Maybe it's all a scam. Maybe after you tell them we cannot give you one, whatever you do, you do, but we cannot decide who's going to die. It's up to you to decide. Maybe they turn around and they won't do it. There were cases like this. The Goim did it, and when the Jews refused to give them a name, they said, we were testing you. But now when you all protect each other and you, didn't, and you agree all to die for the one, 
We won't touch you. That's what caused, <laughs> that was caused nobody to die. You know, no, it's up to Hashem. But now he doesn't ask for a name. He said, cho- choose which one of your kids should be sacrificed by us. We need to show we kill one. He's not allowed to give a name. Not allowed to give a name. I'll give you another example. If you walk in the desert and you have water, then it's only enough to save your life. And you have a friend. Your best friend is with you. And you say to your friend, listen, I'm not letting you die. Take half of my water. I'll take half. We both die. We won't make it to the city. We die together. Allowed or not allowed? Not allowed. It's against the Torah. You'll be punished for it. What? I gave my life for my friend and I'll be punished for it? Yes. There's no mitzvah to be stupid. You have to know the laws. The law is, if one out of the two have to be saved, it's better than both would die. Now, why should I be saved? Because you own the water. Chayecha kodmim. You have to take care of your life before you take care, of, uh, take care of the life of others. How do we learn it? How do we learn it? Who knows from what verse? Vechai. Achicha imach. Your brother should live with you. Meaning you first. After you protected yourself, do everything you can that your brother should also live with you. But you first. That's why they tell you in a flight in Elal, in in time of emergency, please uh, tight the oxygen mask. Make sure you first take care of your mask. And then help others. You are so impressed. <laughs> They're not doing it for the reason that the Torah say it. They're doing it for different reason. Why? If you're going to try to help him, in the end, both of you will die. But they didn't think about this Gemara. The question is, what happens if it's a father and son? The father is 60. He lived most of his life. The son is 20. The father on the water. The father wants to give the water to his son. You live and I'll die. Allowed or not allowed? Allah hakli. Allowed or not allowed? No. I'll give you another example. You have enough money to learn Torah only for one person. To hire a tutor. What happened to the heat here, Benji? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. It didn't turn on. So, you have enough, you have enough to learn Torah only you or your son to hire a teacher to teach you Torah. You or your son, who comes first? Depend who's smarter. If your son learns much better, him. If you, you. Now let's go back to our case in the desert. You walk in a desert, you are Am Haaretz, and your friend is a Talmid Chacham. Your friend is an important Avrech. Avrech. He learns 10, 20, 15 years in Yeshiva all day. And you work in Shushain. You shine shoes in JFK. You barely know two halachot. Now there's enough water either to save you, you own the water, or the avrech will die. What's the halacha now? You have to save him. He is more beneficial to Hashem and to the Jewish nation than you. Talmid Chacham comes before everyone, even if he's mamzer. You know what it means, Mamzer? A married woman cheated on her husband for another man, became pregnant, gave birth to this illegitimate boy. This boy cannot marry anyone unless she's Mamzeret like him. Illegitimate girl like him. From a forbidden relationship like that. That's it. That's his only option. Or a convert. Someone that were born not Jewish, she became Jewish, she can marry him. But nobody else can marry him. Basically, 99.9% of, of his options are closed. 
So someone like this mamzer, that is a Talmid Chacham, is greater than a Kohen Amaretz. You have a very rich, important Kohen in a community. Mr. Kohen, 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 Yamod, Yes, Lecha, you have a 16 years old, genius Talmid Chacham Mamzer. Nobody wants anything to do with him. Ah, he came from a forbidden relation. His mother, in the old days, the mother would be executed. Anoef v'anoefet, the death penalty. So let's say in the old days, they killed his mother, they killed her, and they killed the other man, his father, the real father. This one is not his father, he's from another man. The Sanhedrin already executed both of them. So now he's an orphan on top of everything. He's mamzer and an orphan. And this father, it's not his father, so he doesn't want anything to do with him. I'm going to raise someone who's not my son, that the uh, wife cheated and he became... <laughs> I have to pay for him. I have to marry him. Every time I look at him, it reminds me how my life was destroyed. So now this poor kid has no one in his world. Baruch Hashem, the Bedin put him in yeshiva. Back then, yeshiva, you didn't need a mortgage to send your kid for one year in yeshiva. It wasn't so expensive, Baruch Hashem. Today... The cost of living is very expensive. Buildings, electric, insurance, water, teachers, rabbis, salaries, secretaries, computers, food. It's expensive to run yeshiva. Very expensive. It's not easy. So what happened? They send him to yeshiva, the Sanhedrin, they raise some funds, and he goes to yeshiva. And what happened? He's alone in the world. Therefore, all day he learns Torah. What does he have? Nobody wants to play with him. Like David Amelech. They thought he's like that. His father told him, take the sheep and go to the mountains. Don't come near us. When Shmuel came to look for the king, David wasn't there. All the brothers were standing waiting for the oil to be put on their head. So none of them should be the king. Ishai, 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 the most important person in the world at that time. Gemara says, Ishai never committed one sin in his entire life. Bekarov it's len of one day. One day without any sin. One day. I bless you. Say Amen. <laughs> to go one day in our life, perfect. No bitul Torah, tefillah bekavana, tzedakah. Mirat Shamaim, Emuna, Brachot, Birkat Amazon, Netilat Yadaim, getting up early in the morning, no Lashon Ara, all day, no Sinat Chinam, no racism, no heresy, not watching all the clowns on YouTube for my blacklist. Baruch Hashem, you had a perfect day. One day, you have to make a party. One day without any sin, all day, 24 hours, believe me, you got to make a big party for it. Big party. Ishai went his entire life without one sin. The Gemara testified. Not stories. Gemara, it's written in the Gemara. There are four people like this in the history of the world. Ishai was one of them. And he said to his son, David, hide, hide over there. Don't make Hilul Hashem. People see you, they talk. When Ishai saw that none of the sons should be the king, Shmuel said to him, no, none of them. Ishai told him, trust me, there is another one, but that's definitely not him. It's not him. Bring him over. When they brought David, poor David, I mean, it breaks the heart when you think about the situation. Such a holy person. Attached to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in such level. Tzaddik Yisod Olam. Alone in a world. Nobody looks at him. He, they bring him, like they're doing him a favor. Come, come. The Rabbi came. Rabbi Shmuel came. Rabbi Shmuel, the prophet of the generation. He's in our house. Come, come. Abba is calling you. When he came to the door, the oil. Shmuel was holding the horn, like a shofar. But the bottom of the shofar wasn't open, like when we blow it. It was closed. It looks like a bottle with a, with a narrow top. So, 
when, she, when David walked into the room, the oil flew to his head. He didn't need to spill it. Against the laws of gravity. Right to his head. They got the shock of their life. Ishai. Think about the embarrassment Ishai had. If I was Ishai, I would faint from shame. The boy that is the greatest is going to be the king of the world. Mashiach is coming out of him. And I threw him, take care of the sheep. Don't show your face around here. Why Chachamim don't blame Mishai for it? Somebody like this, you name as someone who never committed a sin. Isn't it a sin? Malbin If you have a boy like this and you shame him in front of everyone, that's a big sin. Don't have to talk. It's enough that you don't, the guest coming, where is your son Itzik? Don't ask. Don't bring his name over here. He's busy. Don't disturb him. Let him sleep. People get the point, no? The answer is because the wife, Nitzavet Bat Adael, she tricked Ishai. He was Anus. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. Read the story. I don't have time to get into the details. He thought that he wasn't with his wife. And in the end, she switched with the other woman. So in the end, he is his, it is his son. Suspecting. Huh? It's not, a, it's not a mamzer, and it's 100% legit, more than anyone else. By the way, David, in a way, got back at his father. He didn't forget that. Who knows where? Very good. In a Hallel. We, we're now going to have eight days of Hallel in Hanukkah. When we sing it, remember this. David said, Ani avdecha ben amatecha. Ani avdecha ben amatcha, amatecha. Pitachta le moserai. Maze ani avdecha ben amatecha. I am your servant, son of your female servant. Amatecha means female servant. Ani avdecha ben avdecha means male son of male servant, right? Servant, son of a servant. But here he talks about his mother, not his father. So I want to ask you, your father is the holiest person in the world. That the Gemara testified he never committed one sin in his life. That means they cannot be more holy than him. Everyone admire your great father, which is a walking Kiddush Hashem. And your mother is an anonymous tzaddiket. Who knows her? She's in the house. She's not walking in King's Highway shopping, you know. We saw what happened to Dina in this parasha when she went out. That's what Chazal said, not me. Chazal said, it's Anit. She was like her mother, coming out and showing herself in public. Look how the world went from the top of the pyramid to the bottom of the bottom. In the time of the Torah, the women were extremely modest in their clothing. Every woman was like a walking tent. You know a tent, how a tent looks? There was no clothes attached to the body, to any parts of the body. You could never see a figure of a, of a woman's body anywhere in public. Jews and non-Jews, even the goyot. Everyone was covered from head to toe. All the hair was covered. Everything was 100%. There was no makeup. There was no duty free to finish battles on her before she leaves. There were no wigs, $10,000 made in Paris by the gay designer who designed the wig. You didn't have all this nonsense. So the women were extremely kosher. No woman would talk to a man in public. Even today, you go to Hasidish area. You go to New Square. The men has one sidewalk, the women had a different sidewalk. They keep modesty. What do you think, boys and girls, teenagers play together on the street? Let's play basketball. Ruchi and Giti again, Itzi and Mendel. That's only by the modern people, you see. Or secular people. From people, the boys and the girls don't exchange any word until they go on dating. 
You know, they don't give them garbage in their mind when they're young. Once they go into their marriage, they have a clean, pure mind. They don't know the garbage out there in the, in the movies or the dirty magazines or the rest of the garbage on the streets. Baruch Hashem. In my last trip, I was sitting next to a friend of mine, Chacham, very smart guy here in Brooklyn, he lives. His father is one of the riders of Me'am Loez. So, we were sitting in the airport. I was very nervous at that day because I was on standby. And I didn't know if I'm going to make it to the flight. And I looked at the screen. He showed me. You see the screen? You are, I think, number eight or something. There are eight people before you or seven before you. And this was everyone go back to school, to yeshiva. This was when all the Bachur Yeshiva after Pesach going back to Israel. He said to me, wow, you're going to need a real miracle to get on a flight. And I have tons of lectures now. I didn't calculate that the flights are so packed because everyone is going back to yeshiva. So the miracle I had in the end was that the number seven, number seven was a, a man, couple, and they had only one seat on the flight. It was a husband and wife. They said, we can only get one of you over I said, no, we want to fly together. So you're going to have to come back tomorrow. If there were two strangers, then they would take it. But because they wanted together, they didn't go. And that's when I got it. I was the last person on the flight. Not one seat was available. But before that miracle, he showed me this guy, Rab Shloim his name, the Hasidim, 18 years old boys. How they're, they're having their book in their face. He said to me, I'm following this Hasid already for two hours since I arrived here. He did not look at one person here in the airport. Complete hermetic, watching his eyes and his holiness, did not look at one person like this for more than two hours. That's when I started to follow him. This is a perfect product. Parents who raise such a child, they deserve Nobel Prize in this filthy world. You have a child, 18 years old, he doesn't look at one person, all the naked people out there, all the wicked people out there, doesn't look at anyone. Doesn't matter where he is, he's attached to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to the Torah, whether he's in the filthiest place like the airport, or he's in the yeshiva in Boro Park, or whenever he leaves. That's a huge achievement. Parents like this should win a Nobel Prize winner, not uh, all kinds of parents who have a basketball player son. He knows how to run, like a monkey. They get all the attention. Wow, you have such a great son, he's such a great athlete. Wow, we all clap. Wow, he knows how to jump. No, that's nothing. It's, it's a stupid world. They admire this kind of people. In a holy world, you should give a billion dollars to have a boy like this. That he will not hurt his holiness his entire life. His entire life. You know what the, what, what the willpower you need for that? But for him it's a lot easier than Baalei Tshuva that grew up in the garbage. Because when you raise your kids 20 years old to be an animal, literally, to live like an animal with instincts of an animal, and now, age 20, they have to adjust to the new Torah world. And they have to watch their eyes and watch what they say and who they talk to. And they have to make sure to behave in a certain way in public. It's a lot harder. When you raise a boy, a Hasid like this, from age zero, it's much easier for him. For him, any other way is not an, an, an option. It's not an option. It's a reg velo yavor. So, Rabotai, we're going back to my question. Yaakov now is putting the children of Zilpa and Bila, then Leah, and then Rachel. What's going on here? Don't you want to know what's going on here? Let's learn. Rav Shach. Rav Shach Zatzal. 
Rav Shach was the leader of the Haredi world. I think he passed when he was 107 years old. Very, very zealous rabbi to Hashem. Very zealous. Strong ashkafa, strictness. So Rav Shach used to comfort a lot of miserable people. A lot of people come to the rabbis to cry for their agony. That's a very common thing. When I became a speaker, I had one goal in my life, to prove that the Torah is divine. Because I got the point that once people would know the Torah is divine, the, the chance that they'll become religious jump from zero to 90. Still no guarantee. At least now they know they're not going to waste their time. So I saw the effect that the seminars have on people. They come in completely secular, and a week later they already Shomer Shabbat. And since it's my mission in life, Mishamayim, I realized that that's what I have to do. But I never ever dreamed that I'm going to have to put more than 10 hours of my day every day for now more than 20 years to help miserable people. Lishkat Asad. Convince people not to kill themselves, comfort people that for not having kids, divorce issues, fighting in courts, terrible things all day after year, all day. Come crazy. Destroyed your mind. If I tell you now a minute before I enter the shiur, I got uh, some message from some lady. Rabbi, you have to help me out. I have my last twenty dollars to my name. Meaning tomorrow morning she won't have what to eat. First she sent a message a few hours earlier that she needs to send her kid to Yeshiva and she doesn't have any money for it. Okay, you know Yeshiva is thousands of dollars. Okay, it's a mission to raise so much. But then a few hours pass by and she said that she doesn't have twenty dollars last twenty dollars left by her. Whatever that means is terrible. What does it mean? She's going to be on the street now? She's going to starve tomorrow? Now what do you do? You have to find someone who's willing to give her money now. Send her money. But people like this all day, all day, different kinds of problems. This is not the worst problem I hear. I know it breaks your heart to hear it. There are much bigger problems than this. <laughs> I got a phone call from someone a few days ago. Believe me, f since then I did not sleep one night. I keep waking up. I have trauma from the conversation I had with him. Kept me on the phone for 40 minutes. I regretted the moment I answered the phone. I told him yesterday, because of you, I can't sleep anymore. This is a guy who was making money and got into gambling. Gambling is like heroin addict, similar. Heroin addict, gambling, same same tragedy. This is a very big problem today with teenagers. Everyone wants to be rich fast. Let's gamble. Sport gambling, poker gambling, lots of problems. In uh, Las Vegas, there are dozens of Israelis who used to, who used to be multi-millionaires. They sleep on benches on the street, homeless. They lost sometimes in one night millions of dollars in a roulette or in blackjack. It's drugs, similar, similar to heroin, same thing, a killer, it destroys your life. So, what happened over here? He got into a situation because he lost so much money in gambling that he doesn't know what to do. So what did he start to do? He started to take loans on people's name because he has good reputation, good reputation. People trusted him, so he started, started to take loans on their names and said, don't worry, I'm going to pay him every month the money. Just help me to get the loan. I'll take care of everything. And you know what happens here. It's like, uh, like Madoff. You have to take from Ruven to give to Shimon. Now you don't have money to, give, to, give, to pay, so you have to take from a third one and a fourth one, and the, and the list is growing. Pyramid. You don't know what to do because you have to keep taking from people. So every month is in a struggle to find new people to get them into the system. 
that when these people will take the loan, he's going to take care of the papers, they're going to take the loan on their name, he's going to take the money the bank gave, pay all the people he owe, and now he's already coming to a situation that soon he will not be able to pay. And what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to him? Besides breaking the life of so many families, it's all Jewish families, probably all religious, that are going to lose a lot of money and they're probably who knows what's going to happen to them. He's going to go to jail. In America, something like this is minimum 20 years in prison. Taking ma loans on other people's name, it's against the law. It's federal crime. 20 years in prison. How can you sleep at night now? Now, Baruch Hashem, he made tshuva, no more gambling, no more shtuyot. He's working on his emunah, bitachon, but he needs millions of dollars to get him out of his mess. What's going to be now? It's a very, very concerning situation. You know what it is to see somebody now is going to go to jail, his children will stay without... Breaks the heart. You cannot tell a person what was on your mind when you started to do these stupid things. Why you can't say it? Because tomorrow Hashem is going to put you in the same situation. It's easy to talk. When people are stress, they do stupid mistakes. Stress makes people do stupid mistakes. Even if it's not their nature to cheat and to lie, they start with that. And one lie leads to another and another and another until it destroys you. A lot, you know what they say in Israel? The road to hell is full of good intentions. Rabbi Avram Ganichovsky, Zecher Tzadik Vekadosh Divracha, was one of the holiest people in our world. He passed a few years ago. I had the schut to read one of his shiurim in Monsi. He came to our yeshiva many years ago. And uh, someone just gave me on Shabbat a thick book about him. All his divrei Torah. Um, it was Amkan. I love Rabbanim like this. They have very deep, sharp thinking. It's pure pleasure to read the Chidushe Torah. The way they compare things to each other and what the conclusion that comes out of it. It's mamash, you feel like you're in heaven when you read these books. There is a, something today that I, re, I read there that there was one Rebbe in Yeshiva. Rebbe that teach teenagers in Yeshiva. That's his job. Teach Torah from morning to evening. He gave him a ride in a car. And before he came out of the car, Rabbi Ganichovsky Zatzal, the person testified after he passed. They put it in a book. He looked at me and he said, I'm very concerned. He said to him, what are you concerned about, Rabbi? He said, I know you teach very well, but I'm worried about the part where the Rabbi has to give his life to take care of his students personally, of their mental situation of their crisis. It's much more than just teach. Teach halacha, teach gemara, it's important. Very important. Without this, you can never become a chacham or a tzaddik. But there are other things when you are a teacher, a rabbi. You have to feel, to feel every one of your students. Maybe one, his parents are going through divorce. Maybe one is having difficulty understanding. Maybe one have low self-esteem. Gonna feel the students. Some teacher they play dumb. They know their teach the kids are in crisis. I'm not getting paid to be a psychologist. Let me come teach my Gemara page and go home. I have my own issues. That's not what Hashem wants. If you cannot take of every one of your student personally, like he's your son, can be a rabbi. Just because you know how to teach Gemara, it doesn't mean you you're worthy to be a rabbi. Shinantam levanecha, talmidecha, your student, have to be like banecha, the Torah says. So Rabbi Avram Ganichovsky told him, the, the rabbi answered him, Rabbi, all I do, I teach all the time Torah. I mean, 
takes away all my time. So I say to him, I'm afraid that for every Torah class you give, you will end going into hell for that. Much like this, he told him this, this mishpat. And he pochad, sheyadunu otcha bagehenom al kol ha-shiurei Torah shatam noten la talmidim ba-yeshiva. You believe such thing? From the, one of the holiest top ten people in the world. Big, huge, giant, holy chacham and tzaddik and slod olam. What anava, such humility. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I remember 28 years ago when he came to Monsi to the yeshiva, how, how, what huge impression he made on me. For months, I couldn't forget him. Sometimes he goes to a very nice darshan, he gives beautiful shiur, gemara, halacha. You're very impressed, tomorrow you don't remember it happened. Besides great Torah, there was really not that much into it. But sometimes you feel the holiness of the person. You want to run and hug him and kiss him and and take him to the car, and can I go with you to whatever you want? Can I be attached to you for the rest of my life? Those one of these holy people. And he said to this Rebbe, he said to him, I'm afraid that for every class you give in yeshiva, you'll be judged in hell. So what should I do, he said to him. He said, go ask Rav Rav Steineman. He went to Rav Steineman. It was a long meeting. He said that I kept telling Rav Steineman what Rav Genichovsky said. And it was very hard for Rav Steineman to come up with a conclusion. And in the end, Rav Steineman said to him, if, listen, listen how Hashem does exactly what comes out of the holy mouth of this tzaddikim. If the yeshiva will demand from you to do something and you feel that you won't be able to and they will fire you, don't take the job back again. That's exactly what happened two weeks later. The mashgiach came to him and said to him, I want you not just to be a rabbi, I want you to be mashgiach. I said, mashgiach is triple of the work. To watch every kid, what they do, what they don't do, to talk to them, to watch them. I didn't sign for it. He said to him, I know. That's why I want to re- reopen the agreement we have. I cannot afford to pay you more. I need you to do much work for what I pay you. I don't pay you enough as it is. It's not business here. Of course, you deserve ten times more. The yeshiva don't have money, but I need someone to watch the kids. Teenagers. Otherwise, I will have to hire someone that will be a rabbi and a mashgiach. And believe me, there are many people who look for a job. I'll find someone. He said to him, you're right. You can take my job away. They give it to someone else. They gave it to someone else. And a month later, they called him back. We want you to come back. That someone is not as good as you were. And what happened in the end? He said to them, no. I went to Rav Steineman. And he told me in advance that that's what's going to happen. And he told me that if I'm going to get my job offer back, not to take it. That was the end of it. But that's not the, the important part of the story. The important part of the story is that sometimes you teach and your students are in a crisis and sometimes some love and hug and uh, some encouraging words can save their life. You neglect to do it. And in the end, the Hashem Rachem, they may be off the derech. Maybe a year later, they don't, they're not even religious anymore. It's such a big responsibility to be a rebbe. What is it, a public school? A gay teacher, abomination, comes to the class to teach math. This is yeshiva. It's public school. Public school, you have to be a super stupid parent to agree to send your kids to public school. It's mamash like injecting poison into their heart. I'm not talking about this. I mean, Maruch Hashem, we know much better than that. I say to people, if you can raise the money to put your kids in yeshiva, do it. If you can't, keep them at home. So what, they're not going to learn better. It's safer at home. Yep. Safer at home. You send them to school, it's almost guaranteed they either become drug addict or every other world will be a curse. They'll be full of tattoos and they marry an Anjou. 
That's what's going to happen. Or they turn into gays. With the brainwash that they do. So what do you need public schools? For what? That they'll know math? They can learn math on Google. Since they invented Google, they should have shut all the universities. There is no need for them anymore. Besides medical school and some things that you really still need, someone to teach you practically, all the general studies, you have everything in YouTube today. Jews now are suffering very much in universities, you know. It's life risk to be a student in Harvard, Yale, Columbia, NYU, all this big shot university. Jews hiding their Jewish identity. Just like you are in Nazi Germany in 1933. Some of them got beaten up. Some of them are cursed. I heard that in Montreal, the driver of the bus does not stop to the Jewish religious kids in the bus stop. He slowed down by the bus stop. He see religious Hasidim accelerate and the people on the bus clap and start singing songs against the Jews. Oh, Montreal is full of Arabs. What do you expect? And the other goyim, French, also not so crazy about Jews. You have Jewish anti-Semite Nazis in Israel. You expect not to have in Montreal? Let's not be, you know, surprised so much. In Israel, today they show a video of a woman walk by a Chabad stand. The Chabadnik wasn't there, but the tefillin was on the table. She looked, she didn't know there's a camera on the street. She took the tefillin and threw it on the floor. For no reason. She walks on the street, took the tefillin, threw it on the floor. Now she's all over the news. They published her. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, I, say, I give those Jews a huge advice now. I hope they'll take my advice. In the United States, as of now, they are very, very sensitive to racism. The law is very strict for hate crimes or for racism. For instance, if a guy has a fight on the street with someone, he gave him a punch and broke his teeth or something, or his face, he can go a year or two to prison. It was a violent attack. But if he added one word, for instance, if he was uh, black, so he cursed him because he's black, or if he's a Jew, he cursed him but he's a Jew, or if he's Asian and he hates Asians, he, he actually witnesses so, or it was recorded by camera, that while he was beating him up, he say a racial word, the punishment go from one to two years to 15 years automatically. This is a violent crime. But verbal abuse, racism, prejudice, anti-Semitism are also subject to huge lawsuits, civil lawsuits. Now I want to tell all the Jewish students, Maybe one day you'll be a doctor. How much money are you going to make? A few hundred thousand a year, working like a slave, taking care of all kinds of Nazis, all kinds of wicked people, clean the dirt, take care of people who want to slaughter you. You're going to have to take care of them. You want to be a doctor? Be my guest. It's on you. Dentist, very hard life. All day you bend down, smell people's mouth, and some of these people want to kill you also because you're a Jew. A lawyer, most lawyers are illegal to be according to the Torah. Maybe you can be a business lawyer, real estate lawyer. Fine, but it's not an easy job. How much you'll be making? A few hundred thousand a year. You want to learn finance? You'll be a big shot in finance. You'll make a few hundred thousand dollars a year. After ta taxes, it won't be that much. I'm giving you now a lottery ticket. Guaranteed to win. Every Jew almost in university today was attacked at least once or more by Arabs, by Muslims, and by other Nazis in, in campus. File for a lawsuit against Harvard, Yale, NYU. They have billions of dollars in storages. They don't know what to do with their money. I read an article about Harvard that they can buy countries with the amount of money they have. And there are still stupid Jews who continue to donate money to them when they die. I don't know what for, but no. 
don't have the merit to donate for Torah, Hashem make you donate to these Nazis. So, every lawsuit will be a huge settlement. I promise you, take my word for that. Do it. Don't wait another second. Take a lawyer. I'm sure the, this message should go. Cut it. Share it to every Jew that you know in, in university. Every Jew. All of them should do class action. Take a lawyer. All the students of Harvard sue Harvard for $50 billion. I'm sure there are more than 1,000 Jews there, at least. For sure, all of them went to anti-Semitic uh, attack. Sue them. I know a son of a lawyer who sued Philip Morris, the cigarette company, for people that cigarettes kill them. By the way, in my opinion, the people that cigarettes kill them, they got hundreds of millions of dollars in a class action lawsuit from Philip Morris, but they didn't deserve to get a penny. Nobody told you to take cigarettes and kill yourself. Just because someone made poison, who told you to come and eat it? You don't deserve anything. They, this was a scam. In a normal court, they would throw them out. I, if I was the judge, I'd tell them, shame on you, you're making such a lawsuit. Yeah, Philip Morris are greedy criminals. They don't care that people die. They want people to get addicted to their cigarettes. They even put addictive stuff in it. But who told you to smoke? You knew all the risk up front. Just like you know that heroin will kill you and other drugs and you still go and do it. What do you want from me? Did I tell you to do? Did I force you? If I force you, okay, sue me. If I put it on the shelf and you're stupid enough to come take it, it's on you. But here there is a case. There is a case. And the university is bearing it. They never took action against all these Nazi Muslims. In every one of these demonstrations, they scream dead to Jews. Jews are intimidated. They beat up Jews. I saw a few videos. They curse them with all kinds of words, beat them up. You have the greatest opportunity to become a multimillionaire. You don't have to send me 10%, don't worry. <laughs> Just take my advice and become a millionaire. La Briut. No problem. Do it. No joke. I promise you, you will win. You take it, especially in these liberal places like New York, this. Take them to the court. Make a lawsuit. Every one of you. What do you care? The lawyer is going to do it for free. He's going to take a third of the money. You don't have to pay up front. It won't cost you. Tell the lawyer, whatever, let's sue for 50 million. If we win, it takes 17 million. Usually cases like this never go to trial. Because the university cannot take the risk that in a trial you have people that love Jews. Or if you're black, you have few black people, and the jury automatically would say that, come on, we've suffered this racism every day. Automatically they'll give him, they'll let him win. The university cannot take such a risk, they'll reach a settlement with you. You sue for 50 million, you're going to get 3, 4 million. What's, what's wrong with that? That's when you're going to say, Hashem, why didn't you send more Nazis to curse me, you dirty Jew? I would have had 10 lawsuits. How much will I make from being a Harvard graduate? In 20 years, I would make what I made in five, five second incident. That's it. Especially if it's on vid uh, video. You know, sometimes people film. If you get the video, that's it. It's a done deal. For sure they won't go to trial. Take my advice. Clean all the money from these robbers. All these fake university who robbed people. Fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a year tuition to teach heresy. To teach them to hate God. To teach them to be gays. To teach them to be anti-Semite or other racist. What do you need them for? They're destroying the world as it is. Now I know what you're going to say. Oh, but they also have great things over there. They teach medicine, they teach math, they teach... Yeah, of course. Google also teach. All for free. Take courses. More, more comes to us, you pay a few dollars for a course. You get the same thing. I once met a Rosh Yeshiva, ex-Rosh ex Yeshiva was a real estate lawyer. This was 25 years ago in Farakway. I saw a religious man 
there was a real estate closing. He was representing, representing the woman that sold the, the house. I remember her name, Mrs. Horenstein. She was 90 years old back then, 25 years ago. And he was her lawyer. She was a secular uh, old lady. She wanted to sell a house in Farakway to someone I know. I happened to be there with him. And uh, I asked him, you're, you're, a lawyer? you're a lawyer? He said, yes. I said, how you became a real estate lawyer? He said, online. I never went to university. I said, how can it be? I learned everything in a year and a half. I just went to the test and passed everything. They don't care. You come, you don't come. Come to the test, pass the test. I don't know if today it's still the same. But he, since he was Talmid Chacham, Rosh Yeshiva, he became a real estate lawyer doing closing and contracts without going to university and see all the wicked people in the class. If you can do it, why not? You have a decent parnasa. Here and there you do a few closing. You, I don't know how much they charge today, the lawyers. You can make a living. Better to make a living on your own to, than to need someone else to support you. Unless you are such a big chacham, then you're doing a favor to other people that they support you. They're not doing you a favor. Because now they buy a stock in life of eternity in the highest level. Some people think they're doing a favor to a chacham that they support. It's the exact opposite. You know Bernie Madoff, the crook? Bernie Madoff, the crook, that they say that he took more than $50 billion from people. Bernie Madoff, the crook, you know what was the key of his success? He made people beg him to take their money. He didn't want to take. He was playing tough to get. Bernie, hi, how are you? My name is Joe. My friend Isaac is investing by you. I heard you're giving 12% clean, net, a year, tax-free. I have few millions. I would like to invest. No, no. I'm already, uh, I'm having too many people right now. Try maybe in six months. No, come on. I, I, I heard it's good. You pay every month on time. All right, listen, speak to my secretaries. We see where we can get you an appointment. All right, let me check. Uh, Mr. Madoff, next time you're going to have in uh, 2020, June 2025. <laughs> you know, like you call to the doctor. They give you an appointment three months. Three by three months, I'll be dead already. <laughs> so they play tough to get. Similar with the goyim, that they want to convert. The Torah say, No. Stay righteous Gentile. Why do you need to be a kosher Jew? It's very hard. As soon as you tell the Goy, better you stay a righteous Gentile, what happened to him? Ten times now more anxious to convert. I remember one time I spoke in a Georgian shul in Queens. Yamkin, 25 years ago. I gave a lecture. It was very emotional and strong. In the end of the lecture, I see a girl all crying. A mush crying. A few people waited to speak to me after the lecture. I finished the first, second, third. This girl came with another girl. She's all crying, shaking. Wow, I never felt like this in my life. Rabbi, I'm not a Jew. My friend is Jewish. I work in her father's restaurant here in Austin Street in Queens. And she brought me to the lecture after the day of work. We worked together in a restaurant. She told me to speak here. It's not far from Austin Street, the Georgian Shul. First time I hear a rabbi in my life. You know, I went to all the priests, Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, all these big churches, all this. But I never felt like this in my whole life. Will you help me to convert to be a Jew? That's how it started. What's your name? Christine. Christine. Top. Not, now we know you're not Jewish. That's the Christine I've been talking about 25 years. Christine. Now, Baruch Hashem, she's Sarah. But I, will rem I remember one conversation I had with her after it's been going months and months and she's been learning and coming to lectures and watching on, on, uh, online, you know. I was in a garage. That's why I remember this conversation. I was waiting for my car to come out of the lift and I got a call. Hello? Yes? Hi? It's Sarah. Now she's Sarah already. She's not Jewish, but she's not using the name Christine. I said to her, Sarah, to be honest with you, what do you need? How many times do I have to tell you? 
I want you to just stay righteous, Goya. Baruch Hashem, you meet a nice guy, you, you can marry, you can do whatever you want. What do you need? A hard life. That's when she told me that sentence. But you don't get the point. Every time I speak to you about conversion and you tell me stay righteous Gentile, I, can, I go crazy that I need right now to convert. I can't wait another day. This is reverse psychology. Reverse psychology. Sometimes you have a kid who doesn't want to come to shul. His brother is coming to shul. He doesn't want to come. So you don't have to come. Stay, stay. No, no, no it's okay. You don't, you don't have to come. Why? You don't have to. It's a merit to come to shul to speak to God. Apparently it's not important for you. Stay home. Stay home. Look at the walls. What happened? Two, three times like this. He <laughs> will be the first one getting dressed to come to shul. This is how we are. Reverse psychology. You don't need, you don't need. It's not for you. It's not for you. You know, there's one billionaire. He's very humble. When you see him, if you don't know who he is, you're not going to know he has billions of dollars. He's very down to earth. For someone that has billions, he's much down to earth. Very nice, friendly. <laughs> someone told me a story that he walked in a neighborhood somewhere in New York and he saw a big mansion is being built. Very nice place, design. He got curious. He walked inside. He has this baseball hat, like your Shimshon. And, you know, little beard he has. Back then, when the story took place, it was about 20 years ago, so maybe Ben, he was 50, 45. He walked in. You see the workers, and one man is in charge of the work. He walks around, so the man asks him, can I help you? He didn't know who he is. Can I help you? No, I'm just looking. Why? You, you wanna, if you want to buy, it's not for sale. He said to him, what do you mean it's not for sale? He said, it's too much for, too much for you anyway, the guy said. It's too much for you anyway. He said, why? What's the price? He said, three million dollars. See, I told you it's not for you. So the person that was with him that day, you know what he said? He said that this billionaire told him, I can buy a thousand houses like this in one check, cash, without mortgage. <laughs> he got angry that the guy insulting him. And you tell me it's too much for me? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. What's your name? As soon as he heard his name, the guy said, I'm so sorry, forgive me, I didn't know who you are. <laughs> but, but, listen to this. There is one guy that is very friendly with this billionaire. Got friendly with him. One time he tells me a story. He said to me, someone gave me a booklet. The, the size of the book is thick like this book. Thick. Bo soft cover. Nice, you know. And the book has lots of names of businesses, companies, this, that, all kinds of gas companies, stores, all kinds of finance companies, lots of, every page, a few names of businesses. So, he said, I called that billionaire, I looked at the, the, the names of all the things in a, in a book, it's all the businesses he owned, that guy. So I called him up, I took a name from the book. I said to him, Mr. X, do you know this company? He said, no, why should I know? He said to him, you happen to own it. He said, how do you know? He said, it's in a book. Oh, if it's in a book, I own it. <laughs> Meaning this kind of rich, he doesn't even know what he owns. He has people who runs the investment. But, Baruch Hashem, Tzadik, religious, Shomer Mitzvot, comes to Daven early in the morning. Who said this contradiction? Can be a top tycoon businessman and be a servant of Hashem. Servant of Hashem. One time I made a program of few lectures somewhere in New York. And he and somebody spoke to him to sponsor all the food. We used to get teenagers to come and give them barbecue from the restaurant, catering. 
So the person that spoke to him, he said that he agreed to sponsor all the food. It was $10,000 for the month to buy for the teenagers food for the whole month. Every f two or three days there was a lecture in different place. So I had to pick up the check from him in uh, Sheva Brachot. There was a Sheva Brachot. I said, I'm going to be there. I come to say Mazal Tov. He's going to be there. Pick up the check from him. I went there. How are you? That. I gave him a hug. He gave me the check. I said, thank you so much. Wow, we're going to make so many Baalei Tshuva. And we did make. We made hundreds of Baalei Tshuva yeah. in that city. Thanks to that program. He runs about maybe two and a half months. That's it. Two and a half months, about 25 lectures. Today you have families with already grandchildren from that learning program. People that already have grandchildren. But when he gave me the check, he grabbed my hand and he kissed my hand. So what? Thank you for giving me the opportunity. You understand? Some people understand what it means to save souls. What happened to him since then? Only Hashem knows. <laughs> It was one kiss only, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But the point is that some people are humble. They know today I'm here, tomorrow I'm in a grave. What difference does it make if I have this number or that number? They're really nothing. Consider themselves as nothing. So Rabotai, we still have an answer to give how Yaakov used... So listen to this. Rav Shach used to comfort the depressed people and he used to send them letters there was no emails like today in any way Shach would never have a computer so he used to write with his handwriting and deliver the letters and one one thing Rav Shach always wrote is that suffering is gold you should thank Hashem for the suffering like you just found gold the treasure because nothing clean more of the punishments that are due to you like the suffering in this world. can save a person from hundreds of years in Gehenom, in hell, in the next world. Hundreds of years. Suffering he has to go through. You should not give up on the suffering that Hashem gives you for any amount of money in the world. Listen carefully how you have to see, to look at the suffering in your life from now on. Omnam, although, I pray for you from the bottom of my heart. That everyone who needs refuah, remedy, should be cured. And they should not have suffering. Why? That's the job of every Jew, to pray for others that suffer. But with it, you have to know and to appreciate all the suffering that you already receive. Do not feel bad about it. That's a huge merit that Hashem sends suffering in this world. Because it's much, much, much less than later on. And that's a very important principle going into the next eternal world. Now listen to a story that may, will, may change your life. Rav Chaim Kanievsky Zatzal, just passed recently, told a story to the people of his house. His father was the holiest person in the world, the stipler. The stipler saw a kid that misbehaved next to him, <laughs> gave him a smack. Back then, people didn't call 911. Especially not when the holy rabbi gave them a smack. They would run and cry for a week from the shame. Today, the father would call, Hey, I have to report an abuse. The rabbi smacked my kid. I want him arrested yesterday. People knew to respect back then. The kid went to his father to told him, Abba, I have to tell you, the stipler gave me today a smack. The father almost fainted from fear. Not from rage or from anger. From fear. If the stipler found that he has to give 
a smack to my son, he probably saw with his holy eyes that my son is rotten. Who knows what terrible thing may come out of him? The father went nuts. When Raphaim Kanievsky, the, the son of the stipler, saw the, how much the father is suffering, he wanted to comfort him. He called him. He said, come, I want to tell you a story. When I was a child, the age of your son, one time I threw a stone and it broke the glass. But not just the glass. It was the glass in the room of the Chazonish. Who was the Chazonish for him? His uncle. Chazonish, the biggest Talmud Chacham in the world at that time. Stipler and the Chazonish, two holiest people in the world. I threw a stone and he broke the glass. But it wasn't just the glass. Chalon Chadro Shel Chazonish. That was in that time reading and he got scared from that boom, you know. He was distracted from his learning. He came out to the street and came and gave me a smack. When the Chazonish saw his sister, who is the sister? The mother of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Stipler is his uncle. He went to her and said to her, I want you to know that never in my life I gave a smack to any kid. It's the first time ever. At that time, my mother fainted. Charav Alea Olama, the most important person in the world, gave her son a smack. She thought if the Chazonish left his Gemara, came all the way out, and gave to her son Chaim a smack, he probably this kid is completely off. And Rav Chaim said to the father, he said, I want you to know one thing. If there is a reason why I became a Chacham and learned all my life Torah and became like my father, is only thanks to the smack that I got that day from the Chazonish. That smack has changed my entire life. My life was never the same after that smack. Your boy will also be a Talmid Chacham. Don't you worry. If my father, the stipler, gave him a smack, I'm sure it's for a good reason. And what happened? That boy was one of the biggest rabbis in the world. Two smacks, two gdole ador. Don't get an advice now to start smacking every kid you see on the street, you know. We have enough gdole ador without your help. Today, by the way, you know, in the time of King Solomon, he writes clearly, you have to be strict with the kids. On one hand, you have to show them lots of love. On the other hand, you have to be extra strict. Chosech shifto. Soneb, no, someone who doesn't sometimes smack, it's a sign he doesn't love his son. Today, however, it's a good advice to give smacks to kids or no? The answer is it's a horrible advice. What changed from 50, 60 years ago? Why 50, 60 years ago a person got a smack and he turned him into a, a, the best kid ever after that? And today, if you give a smack to a kid, what will happen? Probably in two weeks, will become a drug addict. Two, three smacks, and you see what's going to happen. He will rebel against you, the family, against the yeshiva, against the whole world. A year later, you're going to see him with a non-Jewish -girl, girlfriend with some tattoos, and his hair became a horse tail, and who knows what's next. And then they ask him, why you became like this? Ah, I was abused in yeshiva. Why you abuse? Got a smack. One smack, that's it. That's enough. You can lose him. He's full of ego. That smack, he cannot surrender and put his ego down. No. Oh, you smack me? I'll kill myself to revenge. The answer is, I'll tell you the secret. The Gemara said that before the Mashiach would come, before the arrival of the Messiah, the last generation 
will be the field of all the field from all the previous generations. All the worst neshamot of the most wicked people of every generation and generation and generation, all the failures will receive one last chance to come to the last reincarnation before Hashem close the options of more reincarnations. Because once Mashiach come, no one will be born anymore. No one dies, the dead revive, resurrection of the dead, and there's no more Gilgulim. Nobody has to come because there's no more test. Because Hashem slaughtered the Satan, the Yetzirah. There's no more evil inclination in the world. There is no more test. The test is finished. You know, like in school, <coughs> they give you three hours. Three, two, one. Everyone put their pen down. If you write another sentence, disqualified, fail. That's where every moment is about to happen. Mashiach come tomorrow, that's it. The whole world will, is going to take a whole di- different direction. Of course, there's going to be a clean up to all the wicked people. We spoke about this. Only righteous people will survive. Then all the righteous people will resurrect. Hashem will pay all the antisemite enemies of the Jews exactly what they deserve to get. Azima le sechok pinul shonenu rina. We're all going to be laughing like crazy from happiness when we see finally how from the bottom we rise all the way to the top, but this time for good. No one will ever disturb us again. But that's it. There's no point of having kids. Why? Because what, why kids come to the world? To have another chance to pass the test. There's no more test. Now nobody dies. For how long? A thousand years. Until the year 7,000. And after that, Hashem will finish the world, the material world, no more earth. And there will be the final world of the Neshamot, Olama Neshamot. When we say Olama Ba, that's what we mean. When we say Ganeden, we mean someone that is in Shamaim now and his soul enjoy with all the Tzadikim with Hashem. Yoshvim Tzadikim v'atrotem l'rashem v'nehenim iziv ha-shechina. All the righteous seat with special spiritual crown to their heads and enjoy the greatness of God. Do you want explanation what it means, the greatness of God, or you get the point? I'm sure you get the point, right? Karov, it's all, all of us. So, but that's only until the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead will take all the righteous people from heaven and bring them back to this world. But it's not a downgrade. It's an upgrade. Why? If Hashem would bring them back to the world the way the world is today, it's a huge downgrade. Of course, he was in heaven. You bring him to this filthy world. (laughs) Who wants to do such thing? But after Hashem will eliminate the Satan... And there's no more Yetzrara, and there's no more desires, and you're not like a hungry wolf all the time. And there's no war, and no bloodshed, and no more racism, and no more anger, and no more jealousy. Rambam writes, Ma'adani metsuim ke'afar. The world will be like sand on the floor. No one will be sick, no one will be blind, no one will be poor, no, everyone will be mentally happy. The unbelievable days. So, we are going back to the level of Adam before the sin. may take eight years, may take a hundred years. Everyone has a different length of a battery. The difference is that over here you know how much you have left. <laughs> and the battery of Hashem, it's anonymous. You don't know. It may last for another year or two or ten, it may not. So Rabotai, now we're going to understand what Yaakov did. Time is running out, we don't have that much time tonight. So Rav Shach now explain the story. Listen Rabotai. Yaakov comes with his children to meet Esav. Yaakov loved all his children, all of them. Not that he loved the children of Leah more than the children of Bilha or Zilpah, no. But Yaakov 
put them in the right order according to their merits. How much merits each one of them has. How do you get merits? Being righteous brings you a lot of merit. Giving a lot of charity gives you a lot of merit. Being holy gives you merit. But there is one more way. How much suffering you get. Because suffering cleans all the bad things you do. So your file becomes clean. So you do good things. And the bad things that you did are being clean with a sponge. Doctors, shots, bankruptcy, problems, homeless, you don't have a place to live, children, I don't know. A boy that needs surgery is lo aleno. But there is one more suffering, spiritual suffering. People humiliate you. People make fun at you. People put you down. People call you names. People put you on a ban. Kids could be very cruel. A child go to school. Every day is going home for him. Hell. Every day. Who used to insult who? The children of Leah. They are from the main mother. They feel special. They laugh at the kids of the concubines, Zilpa and Bila. Ah, your mother are servants. My mother is a princess. Your mother is a servant of my mother. You're not like us. They make them feel insecure. Low self-esteem. The children of the maids, Yaakov put first. Why? Elohim yevakesh et anirdaf. Now we learn a, a secret for life. There is one thing by Hashem that always happen. When you don't have any more anyone that willing to help you, you're left alone. That's it. No friends, no family. That's it. Everyone gave up on me. Enemies wants to destroy me from all over. You're very lucky. If you still have friends and uh, relatives that help, that's not good. You still have to count on them. But if no one wants to help, who comes to help? Hashem. What's better? That Hashem alone will help? Or five relatives will help? Maybe they will show up, maybe not. Maybe they'll wake up, maybe not. You know how it is with people. Al tiftechu bin divim beben adam she'en lo tshua tetze rucho Yashuv l'admato. So Yaakov sees that the boys of Leah feel special. Mevazim et bnei Bila velevezilpa. Rashi writes. It's not me. It's not my idea. Rashi. Rashi writes. Lefi shayu echav mevazim otav. Umezalzelim bibnei ashfachot likrotam avadim. One sentence. Sentence explain the whole thing that the brothers would put them down, disrespect them, calling them slaves. You, the, the sons of the, of the maids, you're not like us because they were suffering daily, they have much higher merit. Now they can be a wonderful shield. When Esav come, thanks to these kids that they went through so much suffering, they don't deserve now to get more suffering. All of us who are going to be safe thanks to them. You know? So the more schuyot they had. Why Yosef had less schuyot than anyone, less merits that he put him in the end with Rachel? We understand why the children of Leah, they have less merits than the ones they make fun at. But why Yosef is in the end? The answer is because he was the most favorite son of Yaakov. And Yaakov gave him the special treatment. Therefore, Yosef never went through suffering until now. The kids, the children of Leah suffer. Why? They see how Yaakov loves Yosef, they suffer every day. I wish my father loved me like he loved Yosef. 
The children of Bila and Zilpa suffer double. They see Yosef. Where is Yosef? Where is us? But they also see Leah. So now Yaakov Rabotai decided to do it based on a marriage. Did you ever think in your life that you're going to hear, hear such an explanation? When you read it for the first time, it looks terrible. Ma? Some kids you don't care about. What's going on here? The answer, God forbid. So we have a say in Hebrew. Acharon, Acharon, Chaviv. But that's not the case here. Chaviv means favorable. And here it wasn't the case. Here the case was who has more schuyot, who has bigger merit. That's why the Torah said to the Jew, if you got married this year, you're free from the army. Don't have to go to the army. If you planted a vineyard and you didn't cut the grapes yet, you're free. Don't go to the army. If you build a new home and you didn't finish it, you have to put rails, you have to fi- do the finishing, you don't go to the army. Who knows why? Why? Your mind will not be in the army. Uh, let me just hide until the end of the battle, then I can go back to my new villa. Let me go back to my wife. I just got married. He just fell in love, the guy. He has to be in Gaza looking for Ahmed and Mustafa. His mind is now in a house. His wife waiting. They just got married two weeks ago. Didn't finish the Sheva Brachot yet. Moishi, when are you coming home? I'm going to Khan Yunis tomorrow. We'll see. It's not, the Torah doesn't allow it. You planted grapes. The vineyards is full of grapes. If you're not going to cut it, what's going to be? All going to go down the drains and become rotten. You are fighting now, knowing your entire vineyard is going in flame now. Becoming rotten. You cannot focus on the war. You're not going to focus. Other soldiers will die as well. It's pikuach nefesh. You dismiss. But there's one more thing. Me, Aisha Yarev, Rach Levav, anyone who is fearful, is afraid, and his heart is soft from going now to the war, should turn around and go back home. <laughs> Imagine now the chief of command in Israel, before the Israelis go now into Gaza, already 80 soldiers died so far in two months. 80 soldiers died. 83, unfortunately. Just today and yesterday, I think more than 10 died. Terrible. And you know why they're all dying? They're all dying because the Israeli government are a bunch of cowards that they're afraid what the world would say. They jeopardize our soldiers to go into tunnels in uh, all kinds of narrow streets to look for these monster Nazi murderers instead of wiping them all up. Wiping them all up. I'm going to risk the life of my soldiers for monsters like this? Out of your mind? I burned the whole city. Now one house will be left. And I flood all the tunnels. Baruch Hashem. If you remember more than a month ago, remember you are my witnesses. I said, if it was up to me, I would bring water from the ocean in Gaza. It's a few blocks away. And flood the entire all the tunnels. You know, um, you know how long are the tunnels that they build? Longer than the metro in Europe. There's a whole city under the ground. It's not just a few tunnels like some Israeli naive fools things. You don't understand. They have beds, they have kitchens, they have electric. They can go with cars inside. So I, I, say, I said we should flood it. Baruch Hashem, I spoke to a few people in the government. I said to them, that's what you have to do. Why are you risking soldiers? Just spill water. They're going to see water coming to their stomach. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to run out. They're not going to wait until they choke them. Huh? I tell you what they're afraid of. They're afraid to kill the hostages. But the hostages won't die. Because they will run out. The Hamas will run out. They're not going to want to drown. So they will run out. And when they run out, what do you think the hostage is going to do? They also run out after them. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to tell you something else. 
they are also afraid that the entire city will collapse. Even though it's all cement, thick cement, but there's, a, there's, hum, there's just as much as a cement that is soaked with water for, for a month or two, how much it can hold. Remember, you have tanks, they're, he they're heavy, you have buildings. It can collapse completely to the, to the lower level. I mean, there are three flo floors under the ground. Tunnels that are very deep. That's what they're afraid of, but they're going to do it. They already put the pipes. I speak to them. It's all ready. They just need Mr. Biden to give the okay. The master switch. <laughs> let, me let me explain to you how, you know how in every house you have an electric board with switches, kitchen, dishwasher, air condition, lights, basement. You know that? Breakers. In Israel, you have all the breakers and then one final breaker, right? This is for the main one. This is, by the way, the husband and the wife. All the breakers in the, in the, in the board, it's all the wife. She's in charge of everything. These, that, children, shopping, clothing, furniture, everything. But <laughs> the main one <laughs> is the husband. No credit card. <laughs> all the switches are obsolete. <laughs> but by us, it's not the husband and wife. By us, all the switches are the Israeli government. And then you have Biden. Up and down. Biden said, do it. They do it. Biden said, ah, I'm going to lose my presidency. <laughs> <Before me. laughs> yeah. So, Abotai... Rabotai, we need his approval. But everything is ready to go. I think that before everything will collapse, they will already run out. Once they see water starting to come in, they'll come out with their hands up, and that's the end of it. If not, they will stay their ears. You're not going to be able to win them. There's no way to find them. They're all hiding in the ground like, like rats. Good luck finding rats under the ground. And we're running out of time. The Israeli economy is sinking. Yeah. How, how long you can go into a war? It's a small country. Every bomb, everything, it's $100,000. It's no joke. Every missile, you see, if <laughs> building explode, $100,000. One guy asked, listen to this. One guy said, his language was very dirty. But I'm just going to tell you what he wanted to say. Because people cannot speak clean anymore. You know? But the idea behind what he said was uh, correct. He said, I don't understand how, how dumb these Arabs can be. I mean, there's a limit to how dumb you can be. You shot tens of thousands of rockets. Maybe five, six hit. From tens of thousands of rockets. Few of them hit some apartments. One person maybe died. Two maybe. That's it. They all been shot in the air. With the Iron Dome, right? Psh, psh, psh. In the air, one missile makes it. There's malfunction in the Iron Dome. One missile hit an apartment. $50,000 damage no, to the apartment to fix it. If no one died, not the end of the world. The government will cover it. Why are they killing themselves to shoot? Don't try. Pa, pa, non-stop rockets, Be'er Sheva, Tel Aviv. Da. Don't you see that your you have zero hits, basically 0 0.001 hits. How, how stupid you can be? Right or wrong? Right. Wrong. <laughs> wrong. As dumb as they are, there's a reason why they do it. First, they make us all live in panic. Everyone is in panic. Shelter, sirens. It makes the entire Israel suffer. Children live with the trauma, grow up with the trauma, fear for the rest of their life. Second, it distracts the job. It stops all the factories, all the businesses, stores. It hurts the business. No business, nobody pay taxes. And the most important reason is because every missile we have to shoot to knock down their miss, their little lousy rocket cost us a hundred thousand dollars. 
By the time, by now we spend hundreds of millions of dollars to shut down the rockets. Maybe billion, maybe over a billion. For a small country like Israel, smaller than New Jersey, do you know what it is to spend hundreds of millions of dollars just that the rockets will not fall on people's head? But soon it's all going to be changed. Now we have the laser gun. Laser, laser gun is 50 bucks. 50, 50, 50, 50. <laughs> One rich Jew can pay for all the, all the laser guns. The laser gun. The laser go, psh, explode the missile in the air. Once the Arabs will see they shot 3,000 rockets and now one hit, because the laser gun melt all of them in the air, I believe they won't waste their time. If they will continue to shut then, then you can have my stamp that they're a bunch of morons. But until now, they did, they did to us a school. You know what a school? In Hebrew, there is an expression, Asulanu Betsefer. You know what it means, Asulanu Betsefer? They're teaching us like kids go to uh, first grade. That's what the Arabs did to us for the last 40 years. We made every possible mistake with the stupid leaders that we had. And they did every vicious, malicious, clever thing that they could have done. They are very cruel and very calculated. And the worst part is they're willing to take any amount of suffering, include losing their entire family, just to kill one Jew. And for something like that, there's nothing you can do. Every civilized enemy doesn't want to die, doesn't want to lose his children. As much as he hates you, he loves his children. He would never, yeah, he would never want to sacrifice his family or his building or his home. They don't even care. You freeze their money and they continue. Today, France throws all the money of Sinoir in Machimo. Probably have billions of dollars in a bank in Paris. They throws it. Is that all his money? Of course not. He has money in Arab countries, in Turkey. They stole billions of dollars from all the money this, the naive American and European send. All the money goes to the pocket. There's about 30 Hamas leaders, most of them out of uh, Gaza, in uh, Bahrain, in uh, Qatar, in Turkey. Each one of them is $5 billion and up. Who are they? Arab construction workers who used to come clean Israel, Israeli homes for 500 shekel a day. They were workers in Israel. Now every one of them is a multi-billionaire. How they became in 20 years billionaires? From what? From all the money they steal. They get the money and they take it to their pocket. And the Arabs get nothing in Gaza. And who do they vote for? Hamas. They vote Hamas. No, here you go. So, last thing for today, and we finish, Bezrat Hashem. <laughs> One more thing, I'm just thinking what to talk about. I don't want to make it too long. All right, we'll finish with this. You know, Yaakov was attacked by the angel. The entire family crossed the river. Yaakov had few vases that he had to go and get. Regmara says, Pachim Ktanim. It's like, you know, little bottles, little things that maybe you use for, for drinks. How much it's worth? A few dollars each. That's the reason Yaakov went back to get it. Why? Rashi says, Chavivim mamonam shel tzadikim. A person that is righteous, like his money appreciate his money. Why? Because he doesn't steal. Every dollar he has is clean. He earned it in an honest way. When you earn your money in hard work or in an honest way, 
you appreciate it very much. When you steal, 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 you don't care. You lose, you lose, you steal more. Someone that doesn't have irat shamayim, if he loses money, he's not upset. All he has to go is to go and rub another car. That's it. He does it every day. But the tzaddikim care about every dollar. Why? First of all, they earn it in an honest way. But there's another reason for it. Every dollar, it's a potential mitzvah. You can do wonderful things with that. I'll give you an example. You have a dollar, you buy an apple. You make bracha, bore priyayetz. You just earned a huge reward. Who knows how big is the reward you just earned? Five seconds. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Priyayetz. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Shakol Niya Bidvaro. What's the reward? Who knows? Let's do an auction. How much you think you deserve to get for such a mitzvah? If you had to demand the payment from Hashem, how much you would ask for it? No, I want to hear it. Let's start with ten dollars. Anyone raise more? More? You would ask more than ten dollars to say bracha on an apple? Anyone? How much you would ask? You're allowed to be greedy. It's okay. It's Hashem. It doesn't have shortage. How much? Rega, no, I want to hear. No, be reasonable. How much you think you deserve to get for making a bracha on an apple or on water? Huh? If Hashem would come to you and say, Son, I came to pay you for the beautiful bracha you made on the last apple you just ate. How much do I owe you? Of course, the tzaddik will say, Hashem, nothing, it's enough, you give me air, I mean, I have a place to sleep, I owe you my life, uh, you have to pay me for the apple. Hashem will tell you, cut the show off. <laughs> Yalla, let's get to business. How much? Okay, now you have no choice. You have to say a number. How much? Hundred dollar. No? Anyone would ask for more? One penny. Anyone ask for more? Huh? Now listen carefully. Listen up, but really, really carefully. If you take the entire world... How many people we have in the world? Eight billion? How many buildings? Millions of buildings, right? How much wealth? A number all the way from here to Monsi. Wealth. The wealth of all the world. Hundreds of thousands of trillions of dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, there's no, no, no end to the number. Just the debt of the United States, it's one block in Manhattan. <laughs> the number. <laughs> 30, 40 trillion so the, the, how long the number is? So I imagine now all the assets in the world, all the watches, all the cars, all the houses, and all the airplanes, satellites, computers. Yeah, there's an endless number. But not only for one month or one year. For 70 years. 70 years. All the world, of all the people, of the entire world, is still not enough to pay you for one bracha that you made on one food. Now I know what you're thinking. I know this rabbi like to exaggerate, but this time... He had it already. That, that's it. Enough, enough. I can't. Enough. Enough with this exaggeration, right? But then on the other hand, if you know me well enough, you know that whenever you ask for a source, I have a source, right? I wouldn't make myself look like a fool pr promising you the whole world for 70 years for three steps. Right or wrong? So I have news for you. There is a source for it. What's the source? We had... A prophet. His name was, we have to finish, so Mamash will give, do it in five minutes. We have a prophet, his name was Yeshaya, the holy Isaiah. 
In his generation, the king was King Hiskiyahu. Some say the greatest king in the history of the Jewish nation, even greater than David. It's machloket in the Gemara, who was greater, David or Hiskiyahu? One say this, one say that, doesn't matter, he's on the top of the pyramid. He did not want to get married. Nice, handsome, big Talmud Chacham. In his time, every Jew became a Talmud Chacham. It's a legend. Why does he want to get married? He has a prophecy. He has Ruach HaKodesh. He sees that he's going to have a wicked son. His name will be Bernie Sanders. Shem Reshaim Irkav. Mamash like that, Bernie Sanders. He say... Now remember, the men back then wasn't like today, go and, mix and commit sins with women. He was a holy man, meaning he's going to live his entire life without touching a woman once in his life. His entire life. Because he knew, because he's not allowed to touch a woman. She's not your wife, you never get married, there's no kiddushin. But if I get married, I'll make her pregnant and I'm going to have Bernie Sander as my child. I'd rather die than to bring such a monster to the world. Who was his Bernie Sanders? Menashe Sanders. <laughs> Menashe. His son, his name was Menashe. Machti Rabim for more than 60 years. So he said, I would die single and not get married. Even though the first mitzvah in the Torah is to get married and have children, pro I won't do it. Why? I'd rather die without kids than to have such a wicked son. Righteous or wicked? wicked. Righteous or wicked? Impressive or not? No. Any one of you can live his entire life without getting married? No, I'm sure the single already ripped their hair off. How many years I have to suffer, Rabbi? That's the first thing in the mind of all single men. And women. All I want is to get married. That's it. He refused to get married. Why? Because he doesn't want to bring Bernie to the world. So what happened? Hashem sent him the prophet Ishaya. He shows up. And he said to him, get ready, you're about to die. Hashem is upset with you. He said, wow, I'm about to die. He made a revolution in the Jewish nation. Everyone is a Talmud Chacham. There's not one Rashair. Everyone, everyone said he came. When in history you had such thing? No wicked people in the whole nation. So he said, you never got married, you didn't have children, you neglected to fulfill the first mitzvah in Tariyag Mitzvot, therefore you have to die. That's what Hashem said to tell you. So the, the king said, bah, I do not get married because I don't want to get married. I'm dying to get married. I'm dying to have children. But I'm going to have a horrible child that will hurt the Jewish nation with his idols. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to bring him to the world. So the prophet told him, you're not God. You cannot do the calculation of Hashem. The mitzvah is for all Jews. Get married and have children. What will be with them? Sometimes it's in your hand. Sometimes it's not in your hand. There are things that are not in your, in your control. What's your son who's going to be exposed to on the street? One day he will be here, will be there. Who knows what can happen? Don't even know if he's going to leave. But you have to get married and have kids. So the, the king realized that Hashem is upset with him. He said, okay, I'm going to do tshuva. And you pray for me also. And I would like to marry your daughter. The prophet has a daughter. He wants to marry his daughter. <laughs> he got him into the movie now. The prophet just heard that he doesn't want to get married because he's going to have a child named Bernie Sanders. So the prophet is tricking him in the name of Hashem, of course. He said, oh, so what? You still have to get married. And you raise Bernie. Ah, yeah? You will raise him with me. <laughs> you give me your daughter. Now, what is he going to say? Oh, no, no. Why are you getting me into this? Ah, your heart should be where your mouth is. You just told me not to do calculation? No problem. So he went to Hashem, the prophet. Hashem said, I'm going to give him 15 more years to live. It's enough to get married and have children. Top. The Navi came back. He said to him, you just got 15 more years. He didn't believe him. Maybe he feel bad for me. He's telling me what I want to hear. 
So he said to him, how do I know that it's really true? He said to him, you see the sun? Every day the sun comes down at seven, let's say. Today by nine you will still see the sun in the in heaven. Do you want a better proof than that? Who can smack the sun and the earth's pause? This is one of four times in history that Hashem paused the movement of the earth and the sun and the moon. Four times in history. It's in the Tanakh. This is one of four times. In the meantime, at nine o'clock, it's still sunny. Ah, it became Europe, the Middle East. Nine o'clock, still sunny. Like in Belgium, in Holland, all these places. In the meantime, the people of Iraq, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, it's the same time zone. They also see, what? What's happening today? It doesn't become night. Right away, Nebuchadnezzar said something to do with the Jews. You know, they have their temple in Jerusalem. Let's send the messenger to find out. He took a parchment. There was no papers, so they have to write with a feather. And he wrote to the king Hiskiyahu, and to the people of Jerusalem, and to the people of Israel, and to their God. Please explain why the sun did not go down on this date by the normal time. When the messenger was already on a horse, getting ready to ride to Eretz Israel, which will take him two, three days, he got up, this midget, it was a small, evil, wicked midget, the, the Hitler of those days, he got up, he walked three steps. One, two, three. He took the paper and changed. He said, ah, I made a mistake. To the God of Israel, to the King of Israel, to the people of Jerusalem, and to the people of Israel. Please explain why. Okay. Now, the Torah said, the Gemara says, that thanks to the three steps that he, got, he, came, he walked, to give respect to God. And remember, this was the Hitler of those days. Not less than Hitler. In his time, they murdered 20 million people and there was no gas. They killed them manually, one by one. There was no gas. You killed thousands at a shot. Or bombs or whatever. Do you know, that was cruel. He had a minister, his name Nevuzardan. He was the butcher. 20 million people they killed in, his, in their time, the Babylonians. That's why you have in Long Island, Babylon. It's like saying, Nazi party. <laughs> That's, you know, people don't really know. They say Babylon, Babylon. Ah, Babylon, Babylon is the G German, Nazi Germany, Babylon. Tough. No. So what happened? Because he gave respect to Hashem and he walked three steps, Hashem paid him a huge reward. He controlled the whole world for 70 years. Every person in the world paid him taxes. The whole world. Never in history had such thing that the empire occupied the entire earth. He was a king 45 years. His son was a king 23 years and his grandson was a king for two years. Together, him and his son and his grandson controlled the world for seven years for three steps that this Hitler walked to respect God. He gave him such a reward. Now let's think. A Jew gets up in the morning on Shabbat, walk half an hour to the shul, in 95 degrees, 100% humidity. How many steps? 10,000 steps to get to the shul. Each three steps, you deserve to get the entire earth for seven years based on the calculation of that monster. We should get a lot more than him, but let's say the same. If Hitler got this, we should get just as much. No, you agree? Okay. So every three steps is seven years of the entire earth. Three, six, nine. How many years you're supposed to control the world? Over a million years, just from walking to shul one time. Over a million years. Coming back, another million years. That's why there's no reward in this world for the mitzvot. There's no room 
You can't even give a mitzvah for one bracha on an apple in this world. No matter what I will give you, it's still not enough for the one mitzvah you did for me. That's why the Gemara in Kiddushin say the reward of the mitzvot is all for the next world. Schar mitzvot be'ai al maleka. The reward of the mitzvot is not in this world. So, Rabot, what do we learn from here? That it's endless reward. You want to ask for hundred dollars, Shimshon? Hundred dollars you want for making bracha on an apple? Now think about it, how much you lose when you don't answer amen on someone bracha. If you would know that every time someone say amen, bracha and you didn't answer amen, a thousand dollars just came out of your account, gone. You wouldn't do anything. Did you say bracha? What happened? Why are you so panicking? <laughs> My bank account became 80% less. To say amen, big deal. The third place in Genom, if you don't answer amen. Madon Shlishi Ba Genom. Shomea Bracha Mi Chavero Veeno Ne Amen. Nidon Ba Madon Shlishi Ba Genom. Ah, now we understand that it's a huge sin. Not what I thought. Ah, so I didn't answer amen. Ma, of course I believe in Hashem. I believe in the Bracha. Ah, you believe in the Bracha. If you believe in a bracha and you have respect for Hashem, someone just complimented Hashem, blessed Hashem, and you don't say, okay, I'm, I approve it, I join it. I don't, I, you don't, you know what, someone compliments you and his friend next to him stands like this, cold as ice. Paratsuf tisha be'av. If the rabbi say, oh, I love you, you're such a tzaddik, you this, and the other rabbi say, ah, yeah, kacha, like this, oh, good. You join. It's, it's Baruch Hashem. But if one rabbi bless you and the other one, what does it say? Every fool knows that he disagrees with this. Right or wrong? Someone just pray, pray to Hashem and what do you do? Play Game Boy. Hey, someone just praise God. What's going on here? No amen. He doesn't answer amen. So we finish right here. The angel fought Yaakov all night. And because he fought him all night, in the end, what happened? The sun started to rise. Sefer HaChinuch that was written 800 years ago, perhaps in Barcelona. Some said the rabbi's name was Rabbi Aaron Alevi from Barcelona, one of the students of the Ramban. He hid his name. People didn't want fame. But it's all the Taryag Mitzvot. I have a whole series about it. Taryag Mitzvot based on Sefer HaChinuch. The Taryag Mitzvot series. You should, learn, you should learn it. It's very informative. Anyway, so... The angel fought him all night. And now the angel wants to run. Why the angel wants to run? Because he has to go back to his shift. Before it's become day. He has to run back to Shamaim. And Yaakov said, I'm not letting you go. Until you bless me. And Yaakov asked for his name. But he didn't want to tell him the name. But there was another case with an angel that he actually did say his name. What was his name? Peli, Peli Lamed Aleph Yud. And this is where we finish for tonight. Listen carefully. I'm going to read to you what, why one time the angel says something and here it's different. Vaishal Yaakov, Vayomer Agida Nashmecha. Tell me your name. The angel asks, Lama ze tishal ishmi? Why do you care about my name? What, what do you care if my name is X or Y? I've been fighting you, trying to stop you. And you were able to overcome me. The answer is, every angel has a name, but the names are changing according to their mission. Right now, Hashem sends you to destroy Sdom. He gives you a name based on a mission. Now, Hashem sends you to change the name of Yaakov to the name Israel. He gives you a name. Hashem sends you to a woman to tell her that she's going to become pregnant. He gives you a name. So whatever the mission is, your name is based on a mission. 
צור רבותיי, למה זה תשאל לשמי? וויד מנוח דה פאדר אוף סמסן, שמשון, דה פאדר אוף שמשון, אין ג'אדג'ס 13 ורס 18, ויאמר לו מלאך השם, he asked the angel, what's your name? You came to tell us that we're finally going to have a baby. What is your name? And he say, Peli. What's Peli? It comes from the verse, Peli comes from the verse, Afla'a. Afla'a. As it's written, Ish o isha ki afli lindor neder nazir leazir leashem. You want to be a nazir, a monk, a holy from birth, you're not allowed to eat grapes, raisin, wine, all these things, right? You cannot cut your hair, you become a nazir, a holy person. The angel came to tell Manoach and his wife. What was her name? What was the mother of Shimshon? Tzlalfonit. Tzlalfonit. He said to Tzlalfonit, you're going to have a baby. After a year, she was a baron. And this baby is going to be Nazir. Stop already now eating grapes, don't drink wine, don't eat raisins. Prepare. You got to be holy because you're going to have a baby going inside your womb and it's going to be holy from the minute he's created. And when he's born, he's going to save the Jewish nation. Who was it? Samson. Samson and Delilah, the story. From the tribe of Dan. Shevet Dan. So the angel that came to tell her that she has to be Nazira because she is going to have a son Nazir, come, his name is Peli. Why Peli? Because it comes from the verse, Ish o Isha ki Yafli. Yafli Peli. That's why his name is Peli, because it comes to announce Nazirut. And the Torah called Nazirut Afla. What's Afla? There is a verse, Aipale me Hashem Davar, Hashem comes to send three angels to tell Abraham that his wife is going to be pregnant. Mm-hmm. So they're laughing, Sarah is laughing. So Hashem said, well, why, Lama Tzachaka Sarah, why she's laughing? Aipale me Hashem Davar, what does it mean Ipale? There's anything that Hashem is unable to do, Ipale means separated. There is anything that I cannot reach, same thing over here, Nazir is separated from grapes, From wine, that's the word Pele, Ipale. But the angel that came to change his name to Israel, what's his name? Lishmi. Lama ze tisha Lishmi. That's my name, Lishmi. He pushed his name, he actually told him the name. Why Lishmi? Because I came to change him. That's why my name is Lishmi. You understand? That's the secret of it. But the good news that the Sefer HaChinuch say what Yaakov had all night with the minister of Esav, that's what's going to happen to the children of Yaakov from the children of Esav until the end of days. But just like the Jews suffer from the Goim, the children of Esav is almost the entire world besides the Ishmaelim, the Arabs. All the anti-Semite Europeans, the Germans, the Americans, the Russians, it's all children of Esav. We're going to suffer tremendously from them. The Holocaust can prove it, and other problems. But, just like Yaakov survived in the end, and he was crippled, he touched in the Gid Anashe, in the ligament in the back, and Yaakov was crippled, meaning the Jews got hurt, but not died. Yes, they'll suffer. Yes, they would lose a lot of people. Yes, the Goim will murder millions of Jews. Yes. But in the end, when the Messiah would come, the sun would rise to the Jewish people, and there would be a very happy end. Just like the morning came and the light came, and Yaakov got saved from the supervisor of Esav, that's how the Jews would end. And that's why, by the way, the nation of Israel starts with Yud and finishes with Lamed. The Jews in this world are very small. Yud is the smallest letter in the alphabet. Lamed is the highest, led- the highest and longest letter. The Jews start very small, have one step on their head. 
but they finish the biggest. Not only that, the Jews, the, 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 the Lamed is pointing, pointing towards the sky, meaning the Jews in this world are small, but in the end, where do they go? To the upper world. But not just to the upper world, they go to be together with Hashem. Lamed is two letters, half, and on top of it you have a vav, a line. Half it's 20 in numeric value, and the vav is 6. 20 plus 6, 26, the name of God. Yud, hey, vav, and hey. It gives us 26. The Jews go back to their father in heaven. But there is something very interesting, and we finish here for tonight. The Jews are compared to grape. Grape. From all the trees, which tree symbolizes the Jewish nation? The grape tree. What's special about the grape tree? All other trees, you can mix the seeds with others. can make combination. Mix. The grapes you cannot mix with any other fruit. All goyim can marry each other. No problem. Arab, Russian, this, that, Hungarian. No problem. The goyim can marry each other. It's not a sin, not a crime. From different nations, different language. No problems at all. The Jews are not allowed to marry anyone but Jews. They're not allowed to mix with any other nation. Also grape, grape, how do you grow grape? If you have vineyard, you stick pieces of wood in the ground, you put the seeds in the ground, you put water, and it begins to grow. First it's on the floor, then it goes towards the, towards the stick. The grape goes to the stick and begins to climb on a stick. Climb, 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 all the way to the top. And then it connects to the next stick, and to the next stick, and to the next stick, until you have like a fence. And it's all full of grapes. What's the secret over here? That the Jews can never continue to grow without their history. Meaning, we do not move an inch without our rabbis and our sages. We count on the dead Jews. They pass their legacy to us. We have the Torah thanks to them. Without them, we wouldn't have life. We wouldn't have culture. We wouldn't have the knowledge of the Torah. So all the rabbis of the Talmud and the Rishonim and the Achronim who pass the divine information to generation, we are counting on the dead. That's why the living grape cannot survive unless it climbs on the back of the dead wood, which is a piece of stick. And the last thing is, the grape, how do you make wine? You put the wine on the floor, you put rubber boots, and everybody steps on the wine, on the grape. Once the juice comes out, you let it, you know, stay for a minute, for, for a few days in barrels, and the alcohol starting to, you know, to make it a wine. So, in the beginning, the Jews, which is the grapes, the whole world would step on their head. Everyone likes to put the Jews down. Everyone is jealous with them. Everyone wants them dead. Everyone wants them slaughtered by Hamas. Most of the people don't care and they're very happy about it. So Hashem said to the Jews, don't worry. Just like the grape. Everyone step on a grape, but once the wine comes out, what does the wine do to those who step on it? Knock them down. <laughs> you understand? You first step on a the grape, then the, the wine be becomes ready, you drink one glass, so the Jews in the end will survive, and all the anti-Semite enemies will all fall down. Yes? The name of the angel Israel. Thank you very much. We'll see you, Bezrat Hashem, if you come to Queens on Thursday. Don't forget. Baruch Adonai Leon.